life have come here and made it home from different backgrounds, languages, and religions, and who can forget about the food? They all make this a cultural melting pot full of great people and Southern hospitality. Atlanta's rich history is unmatched, known as the cradle of the civil rights movement for good reason. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Andrew Young, John Lewis, they all fought in the struggle for equal rights right here. Businesses on Sweet Auburn Avenue, local black churches, and college students from Atlanta all helped shape the future of America. Once in Olympic City, Atlanta's home to the best sports scene across the nation. Hey look, the South has something to say. You won't find more passionate fans anywhere. From the Atlanta Braves home run king, my man, Hank Aaron, to the human highlight film, Hawks' Dominique Wilkins, some of the greatest athletes have come through Atlanta. We're talking the Falcons, the Braves, the Hawks, the MLS champs, Atlanta United. This city has something for every kind of sports fan. So what do you think? Is Atlanta the best city in America? Connect with us, use Facebook or Instagram and tell us why this city's got it going on. And then watch us every weekday morning from five to seven on the Morning Rush on 11 Alive. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Babe, where are my keys? Uh, where's my lunch? Where's my phone? Hey, where's my blue shirt? Where's my pen? Have you seen it? Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. President Trump signed a bill to release emergency funding to fight the coronavirus today amid questions about why the administration fell far short of its promise of a million tests by the end of this week. Shortly after he visited the CDC here in Atlanta, Alice Barr filed this report. She has the latest for us tonight. President Trump visiting the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta today as coronavirus cases top 250 from coast to coast in the U.S., reportedly hitting 100,000 worldwide. It will end. People have to remain calm. Earlier today, the president signed an $8 billion emergency spending bill for vaccines, testing, treatment, and preparations to contain the growing threat. Taking care of it. The Trump administration trying to calm fears amid growing scrutiny over meeting its goals for distributing test kits. Top health official Dr. Anthony Fauci. Well, there were certainly some missteps in the beginning. And now mixed messages. Dr. Fauci saying the number of available tests is now on track to hit a million in the next couple of weeks. I cannot promise it. But that's what the goal is. While the director of Health and Human Services has a much higher projection. Up to 4 million tests available in the United States by the end of next week. New information about that cruise ship quarantined off the coast of San Francisco with 3,500 people on board. Test kits airdropped. And with only 46 people tested, 21 came back positive. We have developed a plan to bring the ship into a non-commercial port. All passengers and crew will be tested. School districts from Plymouth, Massachusetts to Seattle, Washington, forced to shut their doors and stocks tanking again to close out a turbulent week, ending with one positive sign, a much stronger than expected jobs report for February, not yet showing the effects of coronavirus on the workplace. Just before his stop in Atlanta, the president was in Middle Tennessee as recovery efforts continue after two deadly tornadoes. We'll have more on that visit coming up in the next half hour. Test kits from a cruise ship off the coast of California now are being processed after an extensive delivery operation. A team of National Guardsmen repelled from helicopters to airdrop coronavirus test kits to the Grand Princess cruise ship. The ship was stopped from returning to San Francisco after some passengers and crew members reported having flu-like symptoms. Four previous coronavirus cases have been linked to this ship, one of them deadly. Everybody on board is being forced to stay in their rooms. Princess Cruise Line says less than 100 people out of 3,500 aboard were identified for testing. Meanwhile, Princess Cruise is temporarily modifying its cancellation policy because of the coronavirus outbreak. People scheduled to sail through May 31st can cancel and receive 100% future cruise credits. 
The details vary by departure date, so you need to check with Princess Cruises. Coming up, many of you are asking us how a metro area school, Atlanta Public Schools, are preparing for the potential spread of coronavirus. I talked with Dr. Maria Kastarfin, the superintendent of the Atlanta Public Schools, and the district's plan. That's coming up in the minutes ahead. We also have an entire special section with a lot of information about coronavirus and what you need to know. You can find that right now at 11alive.com slash coronavirus. Such a nice day out there with plenty of sunshine earlier and plenty of dry air. Now the sun is down and uh, clearing skies out there tonight, clear skies, and our temperatures are going to be falling pretty quickly. But here's the good news. We still have not a lot of moisture around. The purple color on this map indicates very dry air. That is going to stick with us through the weekend. So I hope you enjoy this weekend. On Saturday and Sunday, dry air will be in place. On Monday, it's still going to be dry. We're not expecting any rain, but the clouds are going to start building in. And then you see this moisture that's building out to the west. That's going to swing into our area on Tuesday to give us a few scattered showers also into Wednesday. This is not going to be like the system that we had this week. That was really heavy rain, flood risks and persistent rain around. It's just going to be a few scattered showers that will be moving through. So enjoy this weekend. As we move into next week, we will have some showers that will begin to move back in. In fact, we'll have more on that timeline for you in the seven day outlook. Chris, thank you. The Secretary of State is challenging athens Clark County's decision to stop using Georgia's new voting machines. That tops our speed feed tonight. The local election board said the new machines couldn't guarantee that someone's ballot would be secret because they're too large and too bright. The county decided to use paper ballots for presidential primary voting instead. But the Secretary of State is meeting with the state elections board Wednesday to see if the move breaks the law. The Fannin County Tax Commissioner arrested for allegedly forging signatures to steal property. 63-year-old Shirley Sosby was arrested Thursday on forgery in violation of oath charges. The GBI says she forced a signature on a deed to a transfer title for property she was trying to get for her family. The investigation is ongoing. A man hit and killed early this morning in Paulding County. The sheriff's office says he was found on Dallas Ackworth Highway near South uh, Cedar Crest Road. We're told his family reported him missing around 7 last night. State troopers are now investigating. His name has not yet been released. It is a new rule that will likely draw legal challenges. The Trump administration will begin collecting DNA samples from hundreds of thousands of people. This is under a new rule that will expand a federal database of genetic information used by law enforcement. Elvin Lopez is here now to explain how this all works. Yeah, Jeff, so immigration authorities will soon begin gathering those DNA samples from migrants taken into federal custody. Now, this works and this comes from two Trump administration officials that say agents will fully enforce a law passed in 2005 that requires taking DNA samples from any non-U.S. citizens detained, as well as anyone who has been arrested, is facing charges, or has been convicted of a crime. Now, that DNA will then go into the FBI's combined DNA index system, which allows DNA comparison to find criminals. We spoke to immigration attorney Marilyn Lynn Tedesco a few months ago about this, and she says that she worries that asylum seekers trying to gain legal access to the U.S. will get caught up in all of this. So they're now dragging civil individuals who are seeking protection legally in the United States, presenting themselves legally, and yet they're being treated like the criminals that we were supposed to be finding with DNA samples. During the Obama administration, the Department of Homeland Security asked for an exemption, saying it didn't have the manpower to gather the samples, but the Trump administration is now saying that the process is now easier and cheaper. All right, Elwin, thank you very much. The CDC says schools should be ready for coronavirus to spread within communities, but are Atlanta schools prepared? Next, I sit down with APS Superintendent Dr. Maria Kostarfin to talk about how the district is getting ready. Don't forget, we're streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel on this Friday night. Subscribe. Join the conversation in the community section. We have more 11 Alive news in prime time right after the break. The South. And it's one of the most diverse cities around. People from all walks of life have come here and made it home. From different backgrounds, languages, and religions. And who can forget about the food? They all make this a cultural melting pot full of great people and Southern hospitality.
Atlanta's rich history is unmatched, known as the cradle of the civil rights movement for good reason. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Andrew Young, John Lewis, they all fought in the struggle for equal rights right here. Businesses on Sweet Auburn Avenue, local black churches, and college students from Atlanta all helped shape the future of America. Once in Olympic City, Atlanta's home to the best sports scene across the nation. Hey look, the South has something to say. You won't find more passionate fans anywhere. From the Atlanta Braves home run king, my man, Hank Aaron, to the human highlight film, Hawks' Dominique Wilkins, some of the greatest athletes have come through Atlanta. We're talking the Falcons, the Braves, the Hawks, the MLS champs, Atlanta United. This city has something for every kind of sports fan. So what do you think? Is Atlanta the best city in America? Connect with us, use Facebook or Instagram and tell us why this city's got it going on. And then watch us every weekday morning from 5 to 7 on The Morning Rush on 11 Alive. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Babe, where are my keys? Uh, where's my lunch? Where's my phone? Hey, where's my blue shirt? Where's my pen? Tonight, new information about a potential case of coronavirus in Floyd County. We don't want to scare anyone, but we do want to provide you with a fact so you can stay informed. 11 Alive's Deborah Tuff continues our coverage in North Georgia, where the patient remains in isolation. Officials with the Floyd County Medical Center say there are layers upon layers to this case, including putting their staff members in isolation who may have had contact with the patient. Understandably, they say there may be public concern, but they're hoping to keep everyone in the loop and take a very proactive approach. Saturday, a woman came to the ER, Floyd Medical, sick with flu-like symptoms. She was evaluated and uh, taken care of you know, by our clinical staff, our physicians. She was screened by staff asking if she traveled to an area with coronavirus or had contact with anyone who had. Uh, that was all negative. Then Tuesday, she came back, her symptoms worse. Doctors at the hospital took chest x-rays and red flags were raised. They wanted to keep her. We were directed that there wasn't need for more of that, uh, but we felt that she should be uh, admitted and admitted to isolation to our infectious disease room. They were cleared to give her a test for coronavirus. That test is preliminary positive, meaning the CDC has to confirm the findings. We needed to contact any of our personnel that took care of this patient on that Saturday and on that Tuesday leading up to us putting her into our specialized infectious disease room. That's about two dozen staff. Some of them may have to go to voluntary home quarantine. Others may not. One of the criteria that we've been told by public health is that six feet and 10 minutes of contact with a patient with coronavirus is an exposure. Health officials also trying to track down patients who are in the ER waiting room when she arrived. If you have or exhibit some of these symptoms, the, the best answer of this is self-quarantine. If your symptoms worsen, contact your primary care physician and we'll go through the steps. And earlier, the Floyd County Sheriff's Office announcing a new task force to prevent the spread of coronavirus in the community. They say this task force will help folks recognize the symptoms and get the help that's needed. One confirmed case of coronavirus now has been reported as we take a look at what's going on in our state. It is a 15-year-old from Fulton County whose father recently returned from Italy and also has the virus. He is homeschooled, but attended a study center in Cherokee County with other teenagers. The Living Science Homeschooled Study Center is now closed and will be until March 12th, so other students can self-quarantine as well. When we initially heard that there was a teenager who had been diagnosed with coronavirus, uh, I think a lot of parents were thinking one thing, where did he go to school? Many of you were wondering if, if school districts are indeed prepared if the virus becomes more widespread. Atlanta Public School Superintendent Dr. Maria Kastarfin is with us, and thanks for being with us. We really appreciate you being here at uh, 11 Alive on this Friday. 
Uh, what procedures are in place at this point as, as you prepare here if a student or a staff member tests positive? At APS. Yeah, the first thing to remember is that we are not the medical experts, and so we will be looking to the Department of Health, the CDC, um, the U.S., the Georgia Department of Education, and any federal guidance um, that that is expected for us to um, follow uh, should there be an outbreak in a school or in the district. And so we also want to be sure that we verify that it's the coronavirus, so that we don't, you know, unnecessarily alarm people. And then once we know that we will be getting guidance from them. So the Department of Health is a key partner in that, uh, making sure that we're analyzing that information correctly and um, and ensuring that we don't you know cause an alarm when we don't need to. So today we saw one of the first major universities in the United States cancel all in-person classes and hold exams strictly online. That's at the University of Washington where there have been cases in that state. So what capability does APS have for students to work at home if it eventually comes to that. The hope, the wish, the dream, the desire is that doesn't happen, but Absolutely. the way this is evolving, one certainly can't tell from day to day. Right, so uh, so we're gonna lean hard on our emergency system that we use uh, on when we close school for bad weather days. Yeah. And so, uh, so we've tested it and it allows us to uh, provide what we call teleschooling to students. Um, they're able to go in through the internet and Wi-Fi and whatever uh, you know they may have um, as devices to see all of their expectations around academics. Uh, and before kids leave, especially if we know that it's happening, uh, we'll be able to hand off to them other instructional materials, uh, books and supplies as needed, uh, which so long as it's allowable through uh, the CDC guidance. So we'll be using our longstanding practice of, uh, of those technological systems in preparation for, uh, for the potential for the virus to uh, have schools or the district closed. So I think many people might be wondering what happens to those students who rely on school for a meal each day mm -hmm. or those who get free or reduced lunch because they don't have enough to eat. Is, is there a plan in place for them as well? Yeah, so we serve about 70,000 pounds of food a day. Mm -hmm. um, anywhere from 67,000 kids uh, will end up getting, or 67,000 meals will be served to kids every single day. Um, and uh, that means that uh, we are kind of the food provider for a child and their family. Uh, so so we're teaming up with an organization called Gooder. Uh, they will have already started to work on a memorandum of understanding with our district. They'll be able to take our food and take it to sites where it can then be distributed. And uh, so we think that it's going to uh, allow us to certainly have uh, our kids get access to food when we won't have schools open. We have seconds left. Am I missing anything? Anything else you want to get out as far as the message um, goes? Well, I mean, I think that uh, there is the, the issue of um, disinfecting. Uh, yeah. Of course, uh, we're using all of the guidance from the CDC. Uh, whether you're a contractor or a staff member, you're expected to use the approved uh, the approved cleaners. And so I just want to remind everyone that cleaning stainless steel and hard surfaces like plastic is key. Washing your hands. And if you cough, cough in a tissue and throw it away. Uh, those are the best ways to kind of protect. And, um, and of course, washing your hands at least 20 seconds when you're washing is a great way to prevent the spread an elbow well That's you know the yeah to. they even tell you don't cough in your elbow get that <laughs> tissue cough in it and throw it away so um, those are all important things to do uh, to protect and prevent but most importantly if we do have to send kids home uh, to please be patient and not overreact until we know that we actually have a crisis dr maria kastarfin always great to have you here thanks for all the great work that you've done in this city and for aps the important work i know there are thousands of parents that are greatly appreciative of your time here in our city thank you so much jeff we appreciate your support okay we have a guide for how Metro Atlanta schools are preparing for the potential spread of coronavirus. You can find it in the As Seen on TV section of the 11 Alive app. We had a lot of sunshine out there today and dry weather, something to uh, celebrate. However, that wind was still pretty brisk and that did cause some issues in some spots. This is a picture from the Cherokee County Emergency Manage Management that shows uh, from those winds, we mentioned yesterday with the windy conditions and the saturated ground that we might have some trees that come down. This did come down. This is just to the south of ball ground. Unfortunately, it hit some power lines there as well. We did have numerous reports of power outages in parts of North Georgia and then just some sporadic reports of trees down in some spots due to those strong winds. Now, the wind advisory expired at 7 o'clock. 
And it, but that doesn't mean the wind just stops immediately. That just means that those winds are going to below wind advisory criteria. And it's still going to be kind of breezy out there during the evening hours tonight. We'll still see winds at 10 o'clock around uh, gusting to around 20 miles an hour. And then notice that comes down a little bit by tomorrow morning. It's still going to be breezy to start on Saturday morning, but winds gusts will be below 20 miles an hour in the morning. And then through the day tomorrow, you can see here how those wind gusts really start settling down a little bit. By 3 in the afternoon, wind gusts are going to be below 10 miles an hour, and then that persists into the evening hours too. So it's just going to take a little while for us to get rid of those winds as they will be dying out. Now we're going to see clear skies out there tonight, and we're going to be in the 40s until around 10 o'clock, but then after that, we fall into the 30s around midnight and after, and then early in the morning, we start off around 33 degrees, just above freezing here in Atlanta, but I do think that there will be many of you outside the city that will be at freezing or maybe a little bit below that. So on our scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day, we're going to go with a 10. Even after that chilly start, we get up to around 60 in the afternoon with mostly sunny skies and those winds dying down. Now, let me take you into Saturday. This is the afternoon. Mostly sunny skies looking good. Then as we head into Sunday, there might be just a couple of additional clouds that will move in on Sunday, but it's really going to be on Monday when we see those clouds thickening up a little bit more, but we're still holding off on any rain chances for Monday. We really think the rain chances come back in on Tuesday. And again, this isn't going to be widespread constant rain. We're talking about some showers that will be developing on Tuesday. At this point, we don't think anything will be severe with this. We'll see some breaks. This is during the day on Wednesday. Again, not a widespread coverage of rain, just some of those off and on showers that'll be with us. And on Thursday, about the same thing, just a few scattered showers that'll move our way and into the end of the week too. We just can't clear this whole system out. We'll continue with some of these rain chances, but they'll be on the lower end through the week. So enjoy this weekend as it's going to be dry. We're gonna have a lot of sunshine. The wind dies down Saturday, highs near 60. We're up to 65 on Sunday. Don't forget, this is the weekend we spring forward. Be sure Saturday night before you go to bed to set your clock ahead one hour. We go back to daylight saving time Monday clouds build in and then Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. That's when we see those rain chances coming back 50% chance Tuesday, 40% chance Wednesday and Thursday, then down to a 30% chance on Friday as high temperatures that will be warmer into the lower 70s. It's a startling headline about the coronavirus for anyone with a pet. A pet dog in Hong Kong tested positive for COVID-19. But how concerned should you be for your four legged friend? Let's connect the dots. The Hong Kong Agriculture, Fisheries and Conservation Department reports that a dog in quarantine with its infected owner tested weekly positive for the coronavirus. Health experts believe the animal was infected by its owner, but they stress it does not appear pets can pass the virus onto humans. The animal is being kept in quarantine until Hong Kong authorities can give it a clean bill of health. Even though health officials believe pets cannot infect humans, they are still recommending people wash their hands after handling their animals and avoid kissing them as well. The president visits the CDC as part of his administration's response to the coronavirus. So how are they doing? I'll ask NBC's Chuck Todd when we come back. In my experience, good guys do finish last. Mm. I, I consider nice myself guy. a nice guy. Yeah, I've nice got the most beautiful woman in the world in my eyes. You're a nice guy too, yeah. Yeah. I'm saying in my experience, when growing up, good guys didn't oh, finish. Oh, oh. Somebody <laughs> broke his heart somewhere along the line. We're here every weekday morning, so come on, hang out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Televised newscast not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. You didn't get my text? The whole crew got together for coffee this morning. I'm, I'm learning the taste of water, because I'm, I'm sugary. Uh, yeah. Right, right. I mean, that. Well, reward would be... Slimming down. Okay, yes. yeah, right, yeah, okay. Yeah. A little water yes. in my cup. And, and beautiful skin. Well, you know, well, even too. more beautiful skin, you know, when it's all <laughs> hydrated and everything else. I'm not going to be able to sit next to you in a few months. <laughs> Don't drink your morning coffee alone. Have it with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Some mornings what you want isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the Rush Block, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. Catch the Rush Block on the Morning Rush.
everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foyne Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hotspots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. News of the mural went viral when Big Boy himself gave a shout out on Instagram. You can find it tucked away in a back parking lot in Little Five Points. An Atlanta icon, ever changing, always interesting. The Crog Street Tunnel is full of artwork from some pretty eclectic Atlanta artists. President Trump in town for a tour of the CDC as government and health officials try to stave off the spread of the coronavirus here in the United States. Joining me now, Chuck Todd, moderator of Meet the Press. Chuck, both the president and the vice president have done their best to try and reassure the public about the coronavirus. Do you think that they've been using an effective strategy so far? Well, look, I think um, I think the vice president and the and the and the team um, that he's now leading have, have have tried to tried to do that. I think the, for the president himself, you know, he sometimes uh, he likes to take matters into his own hands. Uh, and I think it, whether he means to or not, he certainly has delivered what appears to be mixed messages at times. What the vice president and the task force say and what the president says sometimes come across as two different things. And then the president might clean it up and say, oh, his words were misinterpreted. But I think there is a concern that there is a bit of perceived uncertainty at the top. In some ways, he, he sees it, some things through the prism of what this means for him, the reelect, and all of those things. And I think that that's, that's where he's got to be careful. And if people can tell him this, that in a re-election year, if he looks like he is making decisions based on how this looks uh, through the prism of the campaign, I think that's where he risks actually acquiring more political problems. This is a case where stepping back behind those in the lab coats is probably uh, the best politics he could practice here. All right, let's kind of shift gears a little bit. Georgia's primary just about 18 days away from now. Pretty much a two-horse race in the Democratic Party. It the big favorite, Joe Biden, right now. What can Bernie Sanders do to overcome what happened, uh, what we saw on Super Tuesday? He needs to have something dramatic that I have no idea what that would be. That's my point here, meaning, like, I don't think there's anything he can do. I think if, if everything continues to break demographically, that it broke on Super Tuesday, then it's very difficult for Sanders to find a path to this nomination. And in fact, I don't know if Georgia is going to be relevant by the time the primary comes on March 24th. When you look at the states between now and Georgia's primary on March 24th, put it this way. If this is still a race come March 24th, then something dramatic has happened. And Bernie Sanders has won in places that no one expected him to win. And then all of a sudden, you know, we've got a new contest. But let's be realistic. We already saw what South Carolina did. We already saw what Alabama did. We already saw what Tennessee did. If I described three states that border Georgia, we have an idea of what's going to happen in Florida. It's hard to imagine Georgia is going to be that competitive. Um, but if it is, by the time it comes around, then something dramatic that we have, we have not foreseen has happened. My point is, that's how difficult I think this path is right now for Bernie Sanders. All right, Chuck, thank you so much. Meet the Press air Sunday at 10 a.m. right here on 11 Live. Chuck, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Jennifer. Where do campaign donations go when your candidate of choice decides he or she can't go on? We will verify what they can and can't use the money for. And a middle school student allegedly assaulted for nearly two weeks on the school bus. Next, how Fulton County Schools is responding to a lawsuit. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Andrew Young, John Lewis, they all fought in the struggle for equal rights right here. Businesses on Sweet Auburn Avenue, local black churches, and college students from Atlanta all helped shape the future of America. Once in Olympic City, Atlanta's home to the best sports scene across the nation. Hey look, the South has something to say. You won't find more passionate fans anywhere. 
From the Atlanta Braves home run king, my man, Hank Aaron, to the human highlight film, Hawks Dominique Wilkins, some of the greatest athletes have come through Atlanta. We're talking the Falcons, the Braves, the Hawks, the MLS champs, Atlanta United. This city has something for every kind of sports fan. So what do you think? Is Atlanta the best city in America? Connect with us, use Facebook or Instagram and tell us why this city's got it going on. And then watch us every weekday morning from five to seven on the Morning Rush on 11 Alive. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Babe, where are my keys? Uh, where's my lunch? Where's my phone? Hey, where's my blue shirt? Where's my pen? Have you seen it? Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. I woke up at 2 in the morning to be here. Where were you? Once you allow it, right, then it sets you up for the entire week where you just have lost it. Like on, a, on a Sunday, it's like, oh, let's just order some Chinese food. And of course, you wind up eating tons of that. And then on Monday, you're like, well, I got leftovers. I can't let it go away. Oh, auntie wants to give you a plate to take home from the barbecue. Uh, auntie. No. <laughs> auntie, don't invite me to the barbecue. <laughs> I'm going to be looking for you next time. So use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekday, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. The 11 Alive app is your go-to source for all things Atlanta. You hear what happened today? I'll tell you all about it. Breaking news the moment it happens. The Boyle Water Advisory. Hyper-local, accurate weather alert. You may want to grab that sweater, maybe even a coat. More stories to uncover. More videos to discover. He did it his way. Personalized for you. And that's what makes it so special. The 11 Alive app. Available now in the App Store. Hey, I got the ways to go. I got moves to make. Call me, but I stay in the flow. See, I just do what I say. I'm no, 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 You can assume what you're doing with me to me. Oh, and so I was saying, there is always something filming here in Atlanta. From movies to TV shows, you name it. Some lawmakers are trying to... Uh, make big moves underneath the gold dome. Several pieces of proposed legislation highlight the need for improvement in the lives of women in Georgia. 11 Alive's Latasha Givens walks us through the proposals and their potential impacts. As we prepare to celebrate International Women's Day this weekend, we wanted to take a look at some legislation lawmakers say already has and could enhance the lives of women right here in Georgia. It's a great time for women. Representative Sandra Scott says on the 100th anniversary year of women's right to vote, 2020 will also be another year of empowerment for women. We are really stepping up to the plate. And she says it starts in the home, which is why some recent bills address the maternal and infant mortality rate in our state. We're seeking a study committee to try to find out the source and the sole reason we look at this as an epidemic. Other bills hope to expand Medicaid coverage for new mothers from two months to six months. Time and financial resources, Representative Sharon Cooper says new moms need. You know, we're asking employers to make uh, accommodations for mothers who want to pump. And last year, a lactation room was added at the Georgia Capitol. Other legislation advocates for more paid maternity leave. The state is now for our state employees, and that is our teachers uh, in the university system and state employees, that they will have three weeks paid leave after delivering to start, you know, building that family togetherness and all. Georgia is a place to do business. And Representative Scott says women should also benefit, so she introduced House Bill 922 that would give a tax credit for women who own small businesses. Since last session, other bills introduced lawmakers say could also benefit women, one that would eliminate the tax on feminine products, and another bill would mandate doctors give women extra information during breast exams. And we're keeping an eye on some of those bills mentioned in this story. We'll keep you updated on the outcome. 
A uh, bus driver with Fulton County Schools currently is off his route after accusations that a student was sexually assaulted for several days by other students on that bus without any intervention. The family of a 14-year-old girl with special needs now suing the district. The lawsuit alleges their child was assaulted day after day by two other students on the school bus, escalating to the point of rape. The family's lawyer claims the assaults were caught on video. The driver must have heard or seen them and did nothing. This was a one-time incident. Maybe he didn't catch it. 17 days of horrific sexual assault. That's a guy who, excuse the pun, is asleep at the wheel. The attorney says Fulton County Schools won't give him a copy of the video, and 11 months later, a spokesperson says the claims are still under investigation. Today, Fulton County Schools said the bus driver was immediately separated from the district. We have reached out to see if that means the driver was fired, reassigned, or suspended. The school district says it is concerned but wants to respect student privacy since the students involved are all minors. The lawsuit demands money to help pay for the girls' treatment and the road to recovery. Topping our speed feed tonight, a Marietta man accused of choking, headbutting, and trying to kill a woman. 32-year-old Damian Rodriguez Pavone was arrested today. According to a warrant, he held a woman against a bed, choking her and yelling that he was going to kill her. And says he also headbutted her three times and broke her nose, then wouldn't let her leave the apartment. According to the warrant, the victim was able to escape and call police when Pavone went to the bathroom. He's now facing multiple charges. A Conyers police officer is back home after he was injured in a car crash yesterday morning. The Georgia State Patrol says Officer Eric Green was driving with his lights activated through a red light at Georgia 138 and Flat Shoals Road, but switched lanes before he got out of the intersection. Another driver was going through the green light and hit him. Officer Green's car then hit another vehicle. The officer was taken to the hospital but is now resting at home. The driver that hit the patrol car had minor injuries. UGA star Anthony Edwards says no autographs, please, but it's for a good reason. Anthony Edwards tweeted that he appreciates his fans and supporters, but he is taking the CDC's advice to stop shaking hands and signing autographs to help prevent the spread of coronavirus. The NBA has already advised players to fist bump with fans instead of giving them high fives. We enjoyed plenty of sunshine today and dry air in place, but it was a little bit cooler than average. We topped off in the upper 50s this afternoon. We should be this time of year in the lower 60s for highs. So the cooler air was in place. We also had that brisk northwest wind that really didn't let up that much. We had gusty winds throughout the day. That is going to start to settle down, though, tonight as the wind is still going to be kind of breezy, but just not going to be as gusty tonight. And then tomorrow that settles down even more as the cold air starts to retreat and we begin a warming up process as we go through the weekend. We're going to be in the low 60s on a Saturday and then on Sunday, mid 60s, even some upper 60s in some spots. And then next week we move into the 70s as that warmer air is going to be in place for us. But the only problem is we're going to see this westerly flow that's going to pick up a couple of disturbances that will move our way that will increase our rain chances as we go through the week. It's not going to be like what we had this past week, but just showers developing as we head into next week. And we'll talk much more about that in the 70s day outlook in just a few minutes. Chris, thank you. President Trump joined thousands of volunteers in Tennessee today as recovery efforts continue in the wake of two deadly tornadoes. At least two dozen people were killed after an EF4 and EF3 tornado hit the outskirts of Nashville Tuesday. And as teams clean up miles of debris, they are also uncovering some amazing stories of survival. Jay Gray shares one of them for you tonight. President Trump on the ground in Middle Tennessee getting a first-hand look at the devastation thanking first responders and promising assistance for survivors as the cleanup and recovery begin. God be with them, and we're going to be with them. We're going to be with them all the way. Thousands of volunteers in and around Nashville aren't waiting for federal help. They've been working here since the winds died down. Seeing all the devastation right now is pretty surreal, and realizing these are people's lives, and it's been turned upside down, and seeing people come, it gives me hope that, you know, there's, they can rebuild. As they continue to sift through what the storms left behind, there are also now amazing stories of survival emerging from all the twisted metal and broken glass. I seen something hit the side of the car and all the windows bust out and felt the car start to lift up off the ground. But at that point, it all just went into a blur. This is their car now. 
as it was tossed 60 yards or so in the air. Amber Bingham dove from the passenger seat to the back to protect her little girl. I just grabbed her head and I shoved it down and I just got over her and I just held her. And if I wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't be here because there's nothing left from my passenger seat. There's not much left of their community either. But right now... Oh my gosh. I'm blessed to be here. There's no other place they'd rather be. The final venue for the 2020 Olympics is now complete, bringing us closer to the summer games in Tokyo. Organizers say work on the Aquatic Center was finished in February, meaning that all the venues built for this year's Olympics have now been completed on time. The Aquatic Center, which will host swimming and diving events, was one of eight new venues built for the summer games, in addition to the Athletes' Village. A total of 43 venues will be used during the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. This news comes as the coronavirus outbreak has raised questions about whether the games will be postponed or canceled. Over the past few days, the Japanese government has been insistent the competition will begin as scheduled. 11 Live Sports' Alex Glay sat down with two Olympians today to talk about their concerns. He would tell you that he's training just for today. But the truth is, Eric Kennard is training for Tokyo. And while he's focused on his training, he's also aware of how the coronavirus is starting to affect sports and could possibly affect the 2020 Olympic Games. Now, are you worried about the coronavirus? I don't possess a spirit of fear. You've known me for a long time. You know, I, you know, I don't possess a spirit of fear in that case. I am not ignorant to the risk associated with being sick. Um, and I know the statistics involving the sickness. This isn't the first time a global health scare has threatened to impact the Olympics. In 2016, the Zika virus was the it's big always thing. Something, man. There, it's that always was something. the big thing, yeah, and that was going into the Rio yeah, games. Yeah, so, do, I, do you remember the yeah. fear going into that? And does this kind of feel similar? Or does this feel different? This is a little different. Uh, this is, as far as global, you know, panic and fear, that exists around this. That, and it didn't exist around. You know, the Zika virus, influenza is, you know, that's airborne. You know what I mean? Like, that's totally different. As the coronavirus continues to spread, sports leagues around the world are adjusting, and sporting events without fans may soon be the new normal. Have you thought about the possibility of the Olympics not having any spectators? That'd be extremely weird. I don't think that that would ever happen. It's the biggest sporting event in the world. Have you thought about the possibility of the Olympics being canceled? No, no, I just don't think it will happen. Um, so I haven't really entertained that possibility. What makes you say that, that you don't think it would happen? You're talking money, you know. Like that's a lot of money, a lot of preparation taking place. I think a delay uh, is a little more appropriate as far as preparing for what they have to deal with and what the world is dealing with as far as the sicknesses is is concerned. And while the games are still going on as scheduled, organizers announced they will be scaling back on the torch relay, which begins March 26. Each torch bearer will also have their temperature tested before running. An 11 year old cuffed in question by police right in front of her mother. She says it was a bad mistake and now she's taking action. We know you have questions and concerns. We know there's fear, but when fear drives us, we overreact and underprepare. So here's our promise to you as 11 Alive covers coronavirus. We promise that fear will never be our goal. We'll find the best experts and ask informed questions. We'll hold the powerful accountable to answer them. We'll bring you context and perspective to numbers that are always changing. We will always try our best to answer all of your questions. And if you're not getting the information you need or think there are other stories we need to share, please let us know. We are here to serve you, our community, with facts to help you prepare, be safe, and have some peace of mind. Beautiful skin, well, you know, well, even too. more beautiful skin, you know, when it's all <laughs> hydrated and everything else. I'm not going to be able to sit next to you in a few months. <laughs> Don't drink your morning coffee alone. Have it with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Some mornings what you want isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the Rush Blog, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. Catch the Rush Blog on the Morning Rush. Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. <laughs>
It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hotspots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. News of the mural went viral when Big Boy himself gave a shout out on Instagram. You can find it tucked away in a back parking lot in Little Five Points. An Atlanta icon, ever changing, always interesting. The Crog Street Tunnel is full of artwork from some pretty eclectic Atlanta artists. You always feel it's good vibes. We vibe with it, it's a good time. We don't worry about the hate, we just pass it to the side. There's graffiti, community messages, concert announcements. You really never know what you're gonna get here, and that's what makes it so special. You can find it between Cabbage Town and Inman Park. If you've never checked it out, it's a must see. There are hundreds of works of art along the Beltline. I'm talking murals, sculptures, photography. This beautiful mural was created by the artist Hintz. It's 100 feet long, and even though it was created in 2014, it still remains very popular to musicians and photographers alike. You can find it on the East Side Trail under Virginia Avenue. So let me know what you think. It doesn't have to be street art. Maybe your favorite spot is down the street from your home or a great view. Connect with me on Facebook and Instagram and share your favorite Instagram spots in Atlanta. And come hang out with me on Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Televised newscast not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. I haven't seen you in a while. Where you been? It looks like fun. It they does. are fun. <laughs> they're and they're convenient. Yeah. But they're being... This was a frightening moment for any parent. An 11-year-old DeKalb County girl taken away in cuffs as her mother watched all of it. The girl's mother says police mistakenly detained her daughter while investigating an attempted car break-in. She tells our Joe Hinky she now plans to file a formal complaint with DeKalb County Police. Livid at DeKalb Police Department for detaining my 11-year-old, for traumatizing my 11-year-old. Centria Hendricks says her doorbell camera recorded DeKalb County Police handcuffing her daughter. Yes, ma'am, she's been detained right now. And a second camera captured the girl being put in a squad car. I know she's terrified. You know, again, she is a strong little girl, but this is overwhelming. Hendricks says her daughter came home around 4 p.m. on Wednesday, and the cameras do not show the girl ever leaving. Police knocked on their door around 7.40. They say that someone broke into, attempted to break into a car um, up the street. He said it was a girl and two young men. The incident happened earlier in the hour, according to Hendricks, and she said police were looking for a 16-year-old girl with her daughter's name who ran toward her home. She believes a neighbor mistakenly gave an officer the 11-year-old's name, so she opened the security camera app on her phone for police. Despite me having video footage that shows that my daughter did not exit our home, you're still going to arrest her off something that someone said. The girl spent around 10 minutes in handcuffs and in the police car, long enough to leave her in fear. She was afraid that the police were going to come back to her school and arrest her. Hendricks says a detective learned the girl in the car was 11, not 16, and let her go. A DeKalb police spokeswoman today said they were not aware of any concerns, but will look into it. Hendricks says she wants changes for how DeKalb PD handle children. Let's do our due diligence. Let's make sure that everything is, is good before, before we go to someone's house. With plenty of sunshine today, that helped our temperatures move up a little bit, but that wind bringing in that northwesterly flow.
kept us a little bit below the average. It got up to 58, thanks to the help of that sunshine. Our average high for this time of year is 62 degrees, so we were about 4 degrees below the average. Our low this morning was 41, pretty close to where we should be for this time of year. We should be at uh, 42 for this time of year. Here's the thing I want you to see. Look at this. No rain today. 0.0, .0 inches of rain. We haven't seen that in a while. Look at that surplus. We're still uh, just under 13 inches above average in rainfall at about 12 and 3 quarters inches uh, for that surplus. So yeah, not bad at all as we have plenty of moisture in the ground. So we deserve an opportunity to dry out. We're going to do that this weekend. Now we're still going to be watching those winds. And even though it's not as blustery as blustery right now as it was earlier today, we're just in the process of those winds that are dying down. And we'll see by 10 o'clock tonight wind gusts that'll be around. 20 miles an hour. That's better than the wind gust earlier today that were around 30 miles an hour. And then through the nighttime hours and toward tomorrow morning, generally less than 20 mile an hour wind gusts early on. And then later in the afternoon, the wind gusts really start to die down. We'll have winds less than 10 miles an hour on Saturday. So whereas today was so beautiful with the sunshine, but it was just that wind that was causing issues. It's going to be much better tomorrow as we won't be dealing with the wind later in the afternoon. It'll just kind of be breezy in the morning and then dying out. And we got a dry weekend in store for you. Things are looking really nice and we'll also see those temperatures gradually warming. We'll be in the low 60s we think on Saturday and then mid even some upper 60s in some spots on Sunday, but then some showers are going to return back into our area once we head into next week. So here's that weekend outlook on Saturday starting off right at about 33 close to freezing in the morning in the city, but in the outlying areas, I do think we will hit the freezing mark. Then we get up to 60 in the afternoon plenty of sunshine around and on Sunday, mostly sunny skies, those lows around 37 with high temperatures. That'll be in the generally the mid 60s we think here on your Sunday. So here's the European model as we head into Saturday. Gonna be a great day. Uh, the wind's gonna start dying down. We will see a nice uh, sunshine, really good day with those temperatures gradually warming on Sunday. Maybe a couple of more clouds mixing in. It's gonna be on Monday when I really think that cloud cover is gonna be a, a little better coverage of clouds and they'll be a little thicker. Although we don't expect any rain on Monday. Monday. It's going to be on Tuesday when we see some showers move in, not a constant persistent rain, just kind of showery off and on showers around. And that's going to be the pattern through the week as we're going to see these little disturbances that keep moving through, not a constant persistent heavy rain all week long. We're just talking about some of those showers that'll move in. So dry through the weekend and on Monday, temperatures warming up to 65 Sunday, 66 on Monday, and then Tuesday, a 50% chance for showers, 40% chance Wednesday and Thursday down to a 30% chance on Friday. Again, not the persistent rain, just kind of off and on stuff. And look at those temperatures warming into the 70s for the middle and into next week. After a presidential candidate drops out, what do they do with all of those donations from loyal supporters? We'll verify next. All right. Ah, it's in my drafts. That's my bad. So you slept in and you missed morning rush, huh? Well, here's what you missed. In my experience, good guys do finish last. Mm. Stop. Yeah, I consider nice myself guy. a nice guy. Yeah, I've like got him. the most beautiful woman in the world in my eyes. You're a nice guy too, yeah. Chess? I'm saying in my experience, when growing up, good guys didn't oh, finish last. Oh, Somebody <laughs> broke his heart somewhere along the line. We're here every weekday morning, so come on, hang out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Televised newscast not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. You didn't get my text? The whole crew got together for coffee this morning. I'm, I'm learning the taste of water, because I'm, I'm sugary. Oh, uh, yeah. okay. right, right. about that. Well, reward would be... Slimming down. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. A little water yes. in my cup. And and beautiful skin. <laughs> well, you know, well, even too. more beautiful skin. You know, when it's all <laughs> hydrated and everything else. It's not gonna be able to sit next to you in a few months. <laughs> Don't drink your morning coffee alone. Have it with us. Morning Rush weekdays, five to seven a.m. Only on Eleven Alive. Some mornings, what you want isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the Rush Blog, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings.
Catch the Rush Block on the Morning Rush. Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foyne Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hotspots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. News of the mural went viral when Big Boy himself gave a shout out on Instagram. You can find it tucked away in a back parking lot in Little Five Points. An Atlanta icon, ever changing, always interesting. The Crog Street Tunnel is full of artwork from some pretty eclectic Atlanta artists. You always feel it's good vibe. When you vibe with it, it's a good time. We don't worry about the hate. Been some candidates dropping out this week ahead of Georgia's presidential primary on March 24th. So what happens for those of you who donated to a candidate who decided to get out of the race? Our sister station in D.C. looked at where that money can go. The Verify team is here to work for you. If you see something that looks a little fishy or hear something that just doesn't sound right, send it to us. We'll do the work to get the facts. That's what Richard Piazza did from suburban Virginia when he saw all these candidates jumping out of the race. When a campaign closes and they pay all their bills and pay all their employees and there are funds left over, what happens to those funds? So let's verify. Are there limits on how former candidates spend their leftover campaign money? According to our source, the Federal Elections Commission, the answer is yes. But the devil's in the details, so let's get into it. The rules say they can spend that money, but only if it's not for personal use. So let's get to some examples. Charity, all good. Give it to a local, state, or national party, no problem. You could even give it to a future campaign. For example, Amy Klobuchar could transfer the money to a future Senate campaign. What about where you can't spend the money? Clothing, entertainment, groceries. There are also the more bizarre expenses that are explicitly banned, like tuition payments or funeral expenses. So we can verify, yes, there are strict rules that all candidates must follow when it comes to that leftover campaign cash. And remember, Georgia's primary is set for March 24th. If you have a question about the election that you'd like for us to verify, you can send us an email. Dogs and their trainers, both hoping for better lives. How you can help these dogs with purpose. They're called pups. Days 5 to 7 a.m. You see them all day, every day. Headlines, stats, and numbers, but without context, they're just clickbait. So let's add some perspective. The three most interesting numbers of the day, what they mean, and why they're important. News and numbers on Uplink. Your voice, it is never too loud or too much. Your voice has the power to tell it like it is. Bringing us together to act. Together our voices grow. Together we come alive. Amplifying voices and breaking down barriers to change the story and shape the future. Together we are unstoppable. Together we are where Atlanta speaks. Remember the old days, the old cliffhangers when we used to watch shows? Hey, and they cliffhangers. Would, you know, they didn't ah. wait the next week. You're, oh, what's going to happen to the $6 million man? He was hanging with his one bionic arm. Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m. Only on 11 Alive. Atlanta, almost 6 million people call the Metro home. But what makes this place so great? I'm 11 Alive's Chesley McNeil. I'm going to give you three reasons why Atlanta is the best city in America. Come on, man, it's the heart of the South. And it's one of the most diverse cities around. People from all walks of life have come here and made it home from different backgrounds, languages, and religions. And who can forget about the food? They all make this a cultural melting pot full of great people and Southern hospitality. Atlanta's rich history is unmatched, known as the cradle of the civil rights movement for good reason. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Andrew Young, John Lewis, they all fought in the struggle for equal rights right here. Businesses on Sweet Auburn Avenue, local black churches, and college students from Atlanta all helped shape the future of America. Once an Olympic city, Atlanta's home to the best sports scene across the nation. Hey look, the South has something to say. You won't find more passionate fans anywhere. 
From the Atlanta Braves home run king, my man, Hank Aaron, to the human highlight film, Hawks' Dominique Wilkins, some of the greatest athletes have come through Atlanta. We're talking the Falcons, the Braves, the Hawks, the MLS champs, Atlanta United. This city has something for every kind of sports fan. So what do you think? Is Atlanta the best city in America? Connect with us. Use Facebook or Instagram and tell us why this city's got it going on. And then watch us every weekday morning from 5 to 7 on The Morning Rush on 11 Alive. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's... The first South County Jail's Pups with Purpose program was launched just a few months ago, and now two of their most recent graduates are in need of loving forever homes. This is Lizzie. <laughs> she spent over a year in the animal shelter. This is Stella. She's a husky mix. She's right over a year old. Well, the program pairs dogs like Lizzie and Stella with chosen inmates that are, who are carefully selected. They work with a volunteer dog trainer to teach them obedience and other good behavior. The hope is that the inmates learn how to care for the animals, and the dogs are eventually adopted. But so far, there have not been any applications to bring Lizzie or Stella home. So Pups with Purpose is waiving adoption fees for both dogs. If you tell them you saw it on 11 Alive. To learn more about the program and how to adopt, visit the My Coming News section of 11alive.com. I don't think they're going to be over there for much longer. No, I don't think so either. We need to get those dogs some of those striped prisoner shirts. Oh, oh boy. Okay. Jeff? You guys don't like that? Uh, oh, it's a sharp. I feel a little uncomfortable <laughs> right now. I was trying to get Marcos, yeah, 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 our right, floor crew right, director, right. to adopt one of the dogs for his daughter, but he, wouldn't, he wasn't going those for Those are beautiful it. dogs. Yeah, they, they are. are beautiful They're dogs. Really okay, why don't we move on? <laughs> It's almost, it's almost 9 o'clock, folks, and we have a lot coming up here on Primetime News. President Donald Trump tours CDC headquarters here in Atlanta. His message for the country as the number of confirmed cases continues to grow. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Well, let's start right there with President Trump touring CDC headquarters in Atlanta late this afternoon. And we should point out that during that tour, he expressed confidence that the CDC is working hard to get ahead of this virus. Here's John Sherrick. This was a presidential pat on the back for CDC researchers and administrators here in Atlanta and around the world who are working to detect a fast-moving coronavirus faster than it can spread. President Trump trying to reassure a worried world from inside the CDC lab that has struggled to come up with a test for coronavirus from scratch and is now racing to distribute 4 million tests across the U.S. within the next seven days to start. The testing has been amazing, actually, what they've been able to produce in such a short period of time. They heard there was a problem in China. That's when they started working on this, and that's pretty incredible. That's why we're in good shape. President Trump yeah. calling on Georgia's yeah. Governor Brian Kemp at one point to say that the CDC has now delivered the test kits to Georgia, the state now able to detect on its own anyone who might be infected fast and quarantine them. Anybody that wants a test can get a test. That's and what I, I would just say that is. we started testing in our lab in Georgia, our uh, Department of Public Health yesterday, which is a day earlier we thought it would be today. So we're actually testing today. So the governor and the president and the CDC emphasizing that the war on coronavirus in the U.S includes getting the new test to every community quickly for early detection in order to isolate those infected. Well, just to bring you up to date tonight, Georgia stands at two coronavirus cases officially, but the CDC is waiting to see if a Floyd County woman's test positive for COVID-19. So this after two trips to the hospital landed her in isolation. The 11 Alive's Deborah Tuff is continuing our coverage tonight. Reps with the Floyd County Medical Center say the isolation room can actually only hold one patient at a time, but in the case that they need room for more patients, they have that room available at the hospital. We have created a unit to take care of patients like this. And in fact, we put it together back when the Ebola scare was going on several years ago. That's Floyd Medical Center President and CEO Kurt Stunkel. He says a 46-year-old woman came to the hospital Saturday with flu-like symptoms. She was screened, 
but had not traveled or had contact with anyone who had traveled. She was released but came back a few days later, even more sick. Hospital staff put her in isolation as a precautionary measure. They later discovered she could possibly have coronavirus. Now the CDC will decide if she does. Health officials will try and track down who she's had contact with over the past couple of weeks. We've got negative pressure rooms throughout the hospital where we can take care of these patients. And what that means is as the airflow is not circulated in our system, it's, it's ventilated to the outside. And so we've got places where we can put more patients if we need to. So with the continuing spread of the coronavirus in the United States, there's a growing focus on the availability of the COVID-19 testing kits. Governor Brian Kemp said yesterday more than 2,500 kits had been distributed to states. So that translates to more than 1 million people who can be tested. And Vice President Mike Pence said more than 5 million tests will be available by the end of next week, but more are needed. But it's still just a beginning as our nation continues to, to uh, hear of new cases every day. We want to make sure the testing is available broadly. While we're meeting the demand of cases we know about today, we still have a ways to go. Individual states' public health labs are now cleared to run those tests, but there's also a push for companies developing new rapid result tests that could cut the wait time for results from four plus hours down to just one. There are now more than 200 confirmed coronavirus cases across 24 states, including those right here in Georgia. Kentucky just confirmed its first case and 14 people have died as the number of people infected worldwide swells past 100,000. Meanwhile, U.S. Customs and Border Protection has released the number of travelers agents have sent for enhanced health screenings. From February 2nd through March 4th, more than 63,000 travelers at U.S. ports of entry have been referred to the CDC. Most of those were airline passengers. Fewer than 800 came by land and just 113 travelers came by ship. On average, CBP processes more than 1 million people a day. Well, this morning, President Trump signed the bipartisan emergency coronavirus spending package. It passed both the House and the Senate almost unanimously earlier this week. It allocates more than $8 billion to combat the spread of COVID-19. More than $2 billion is earmarked for the CDC for prevention and response. Another $3 billion will go to a public health emergency fund and the National Institutes of Health to research and develop vaccines and treatments. It also provides nearly $1.3 billion to help protect Americans living abroad from coronavirus. You know, some of the questions you've been asking us the most concern Georgia schools coronavirus response. Now, during our five o'clock show today, we spoke exclusively with Atlanta Public School Superintendent Maria Karstarfin, who spoke about preparation should Metro schools be forced to close. So we're going to lean hard on our emergency system that we use uh, on when we close school for bad weather days. Yeah. And so uh, so we've tested it and it allows us to uh, provide what we call teleschooling to students. Um, they're able to go in through the Internet and Wi-Fi and whatever, uh, you know, they may have um, as devices to see all of their expectations around academics. Now, you can watch the full conversation on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Here at 11 Alive, we want to make sure that you get the facts, not false information out there about the coronavirus, and you can find tips to protect yourself and your family, as well as the latest on the fight against the virus right here in our state of Georgia, anytime on 11alive.com. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. What a great day we had. A lot of sunshine. The only problem with today's weather is the wind. I'm talking to about uh, 250 people on Facebook Live right now. That's why my phone is showing up here uh, on camera. And a lot of folks are talking about those winds uh, that we had out there for today and wondering when they're going to calm down. They'll start calming down during the day tomorrow. Take a look at what we have right now. 21 mile an hour winds here in Atlanta, but outside the city, the wind aren't as strong. We have 17 mile an hour winds down in Peachtree City, but look at Canton, only five mile an hour winds there. In Gainesville, 10 mile an hour winds there. Let me show you the forecast track and you can see what we're watching as we go through the rest of the nighttime hours. We're going to see those winds start to die down a little bit. Now these are wind gusts. These are a little bit higher than those sustained winds showing we'll still have wind gusts maybe next hour 
around 20 miles an hour. In fact, our peak wind gust today was 38 miles an hour in Atlanta. And we're going to go down tomorrow morning to about 17 mile an hour wind gusts. And then look what happens through lunchtime. We go and, and after lunch, we go down to wind gusts less than 10 miles an hour. So this is showing us more of those improvements that we're expecting here in our forecast during the day tomorrow with the winds dying down and the temperatures will start warming up a little bit more with our highs getting into around 60 degrees tomorrow afternoon. Stay with us. That warm up continues moving into Sunday, but we do have rain chances coming back. We'll pinpoint that in the seven day outlook. The list of options for Georgia's junior U.S. Senate seat continue to expand. Today, Reverend Raphael Warnock officially entered the contest against Senator Kelly Leffler. This is a critical moment in the history of our country. So many people are depending on us. Reverend Warnock is one of several Democrats hoping to win November's special election and take the seat formerly held by Senator Johnny Isaacson. Governor Brian Kemp appointed Republican Kelly Leffler, who also faces a challenge from fellow Republican Congressman Doug Collins. Georgia's other Senate seat is also up for grabs this year. Incumbent Senator David Perdue is so far unopposed in May's Republican primary. But on the Democratic ticket, one-time 6th Congressional District candidate John Ossoff will face former Columbus Mayor Teresa Tomlinson, Executive Sarah Riggs Amico, Air Force veteran James Knox, and three others. You know, it's a new rule that will likely draw legal challenges. The Trump administration will begin collecting DNA samples from hundreds of thousands of people under a new rule that will expand a federal database of genetic information used by law enforcement. Eleven Allies' Elwin Lopez is here to explain how this all works. Elwin? Yeah, Ron, immigration authorities will soon begin gathering DNA samples from migrants taken into federal custody. Two Trump administration officials say agents will fully enforce a law passed in 2005 that requires taking DNA samples from any non-U.S. citizens detained, as well as anyone who has been arrested, is facing charges, or has been convicted of a crime. Now, that DNA will then go into the FBI's combined DNA index system, which allows a DNA comparison to find criminals. We spoke to immigration attorney Mary Lynn Tedesco a few months ago about this, and she told me that she worries that asylum seekers trying to gain legal access to the U.S. will get caught up in all of this. They're now dragging civil individuals who are seeking protection legally in the United States, presenting themselves legally, and yet they're being treated like the criminals that we were supposed to be finding with DNA samples. So during the Obama administration, the Department of Homeland Security asked for an exemption, saying it didn't have the manpower to gather the samples. But the Trump administration is now saying that the process is easier and cheaper. Ron. All right. Thanks a lot. All right. Straight ahead. On this uh, International Women's Day, Georgia lawmakers working to make things better for females in our state. We're going to break down how these bills could help. And there he is. It is the hardest working man in weather. Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb is live on Facebook right now taking all of your weather questions. You can join that conversation right now on his Facebook page. We will catch up with him just after the break. And don't forget, we are streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Subscribe and join the conversation in the community section. We got more 11 Alive news prime time after the break. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. You didn't get my text? The whole crew got together for coffee this morning. I'm, I'm learning the taste of water, because I'm, I'm sugary. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. right, right. about that. Well, reward would be... Slimming down. Okay, yes. yeah, right, yeah, okay. Yeah, a little water yes. in my cup. And, and beautiful skin. Well, you well, know, I even too. more beautiful skin, you know, when it's all <laughs> hydrated and everything else. I'm not going to be able to sit next to you in a few months. <laughs> Don't drink your morning coffee alone. Have it with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Some mornings what you want isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the Rush Block, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. Catch the Rush Block on the Morning Rush. Everybody's learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. 
It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots. More than Georgia's population, more than half of Georgia's population is female, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, but that's not reflected in the makeup of the state legislature, which is responsible for so many decisions that impact our lives. Latasha Givens takes a look at some of the proposals lawmakers say will help Georgia's women. As we prepare to celebrate International Women's Day this weekend, we wanted to take a look at some legislation lawmakers say already has and could enhance the lives of women right here in Georgia. Since last year, Georgia lawmakers have introduced legislation addressing issues like expand Medicaid coverage for new mothers, time and financial resources, Representative Sharon Cooper says new moms need. Eliminating the tax on feminine products and mandating doctors give more information during breast exams were also a hot topic. Other bills addressed the maternal and infant mortality rate in our state and advocating for more paid maternity leave is something Representative Sharon Cooper is backing. Uh, the state is now for our state employees, and that is our teachers uh, in the university system and state employees, that they will have three weeks paid leave after delivering to start, you know, building that family togetherness and all. Representative Sandra Scott introduced House Bill 922 that would give a tax credit for women who own small businesses. We are really stepping up to the plate. We are really coming out. And it's going to take women to make the difference in this world. And we're keeping an eye on some of those bills mentioned in this story. We'll keep you updated on the outcome. A decision in Athens to eliminate the state's new voting machines is getting challenged by the Georgia Secretary of State. On Wednesday, Athens Clark County started using hand marked paper ballots during early voting in the presidential primary. That after the local election board decided the new voting machines could not guarantee ballot secrecy. The new voting machines are large and bright and upright. Uh, they also cost the state about more than a hundred million dollars. The Secretary of State has called a meeting of the state election board next Wednesday to determine if athens Clark County is violating state law by using hand-marked paper ballots. We have a team of 11 Alive journalists dedicated to covering the political issues that matter the most to you during this election year. Be sure to check out our politics section of 11alive.com. And it's Friday night. We're having a good party right now on uh, Facebook Live. That's why my phone is sticking up here in the shot. We've got still about 150 people on right now on a Friday. That's great. And the weather's quiet, too, but a lot of folks are interested to find out what's happening for the weekend. When is the wind going to calm down? And um, when is the rain coming back? So I'm going to answer all those questions for you coming up. Let's first take a look at the current winds that we have in our area. And you know, it's been kind of blustery out there for today. Take a look at this. We have winds right now in Atlanta of 21 miles an hour. And Atlanta is one of the areas that has some of the stronger winds. And we often see that here in the city where those, the winds going in between all the buildings and everything. It just makes it a little more blustery here. Uh, but outside the city, we still have 12 mile an hour winds in Marietta, 10 mile an hour winds in Gainesville. Duluth, you're only at eight mile an hour winds, but Peachtree City has 17 mile an hour winds. Now here's a look again at the wind gusts. I know I showed you all this a minute ago, but I just want to walk you through this, showing how this evening the wind gusts are still going to be there, not as strong as they were today when we had a peak wind gust of 38 miles an hour. So what's going to happen is through the nighttime hours, still some breezes, but these wind gusts start to come down a little bit in the morning. Still 17 mile an hour wind gust here in Atlanta, maybe 20 mile an hour wind gust in, in Canton. So breezy in the morning when those temperatures are going to be close to freezing. So with the wind chill, it's going to be kind of chilly to start in the morning. But then this is what I want you to see for all of you who are enjoying the sunshine today, but just wish we didn't have the wind. We're going to have sunshine tomorrow and the wind is going to start dying down. This is by three in the afternoon. The wind speeds less than 10 miles an hour. And then by 10 o'clock at night, pretty calm. Not much of a wind going on at all. So that'll be a good thing for you tomorrow with those temperatures warming up a little bit more. Right now, it is kind of chilly. And with these clear skies, we're thinking these temperatures are going to drop even more. We'll go to about 41 right now in Gainesville and in Canton 30s in Blairsville and in Clayton. Watch the forecast track. 
This is what we'll be waking up to tomorrow morning. If you wake up at seven o'clock in the morning, I know it's Saturday, you might be like, I'm not waking up at, at, when it's that cold. But if you're waking up around seven in the morning, 33 degrees here in town, that's where we'll see our low temperature in the morning, just above freezing. But we will see some spots outside the city that'll be at freezing, like Carrollton, Marietta, Canton, Rome, Dalton, Blairsville, Clayton, also Eatonton at 32 degrees. So really just really close to freezing in the morning. And with that wind, it's going to feel even colder. By lunchtime, we're warming up into the upper 40s to around 50 degrees. And I actually think we're going to top off tomorrow near 60. We're going to see some good warming tomorrow. Once those winds start to die down a little bit and we see how, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of sunshine out there, we'll warm up to about 60. Today was 58. So I think we'll be a couple of degrees warmer tomorrow, but it's going to be that really uh, chilly start. Here's a look at the European model. Uh, Saturday looking good, but on Sunday, there may be just a few more clouds, but these are going to be thin clouds, not rain producers or anything. On Monday, these clouds are going to be a little thicker and a, a little better coverage of clouds on Monday. Southerly flow will keep that warming process continuing, and then on Tuesday. That's when we're going to see some rain chances here. But what I've been telling everybody all day long and all night on our newscast is this rain that we're having on Tuesday is not like what we were dealing with last week. That was such heavy rain. We had the flood risk every single day, and it seemed like the rain was a lot more persistent. We're going to have a lot more off times with the rain going from Tuesday to Wednesday. See how we'll have some breaks in the action on Wednesday. So we're talking about showers, meaning off and on stuff, not a constant rain. And on Thursday, scattered showers. Friday, scattered showers as well. So rain chances are going to be about 40 to 50 percent there for the end of the week. So for the weekend, enjoy it. We're going to see mostly sunny skies uh, both days. Temperatures warming up. We'll eventually get up to about 65 degrees on Sunday. And then on Monday, the warm up is going to continue. We'll get up to 66 degrees Monday, but a few more clouds are going to start building in. And then on Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, the rain chance is coming back and on Tuesday as well. In fact, Tuesday is the day with the highest rain chance at 50%, uh, 40% chance Wednesday and Thursday, then a 30% chance on Friday. And notice these temperatures, though, moving up into the lower 70s for the middle and end of the week. Nice. All right. Thanks a lot, Chris. You know, as more cases of the coronavirus are confirmed by the CDC, we are continuing to share facts, not fear, about the virus. And as part of that, our Verify team is looking into claims that you can make your own hand sanitizer if you can't find any in the store. Here's our Jason Puckett. We're tackling claims you can make your own hand sanitizer at home. But first, I've got to say, the CDC, WHO, and most other experts say that you should be washing your hands as much as possible and only using sanitizer when you can't. Hand sanitizer should also not be used if your hands are visibly dirty. Okay, we got that out of the way. Here's our core claim. Headlines and articles teaching you how to make your own hand sanitizer if you can't buy any at the store. So can you actually do this, and is it safe and effective? We're verifying. Our sources the CDC and WHO. When we dug into this, we found recipes from the World Health Organization that have been online for 10 years. They combine alcohol and hydrogen peroxide with a bonding gel. They recommend glycerol, but aloe vera also works. The key to all of this is the alcohol content. Per the CDC, if the alcohol content is 60% or higher, it can kill most bacteria and break down most viruses. Note here, some outlets are saying strong liquor like vodka can be used. Vodka technically is ethanol, which is in the WHO recipes, but most vodka is only about 40% alcohol, which would not meet the CDC and WHO recommendations. Once you've got your ingredients, combine them in a large jar or container, and you have a functioning hand sanitizer. So claim verify, you can make your own effective hand sanitizer. Keep in mind, the recipe is only effective if mixed properly. To help you out, we have the WHO recipe online. And if you're seeing more claims like this, send us an email. With your verify, I'm Jason Puckett. You know, the president visits the CDC as part of his administration's response to the coronavirus. So how are they doing? We ask NBC's Chuck Todd when we come back. And how about a little luck of the Irish as we go to break? Today, Savannah's Forsyth Park Fountain was dyed bright green in honor of St. Patrick's Day. The annual greeting ceremony marks the start of the city's celebrations. Organizers say they are ready with sanitizing stations on hand to help fight the spread of coronavirus. How'd you like my Irish accent? It was okay. <laughs> I'll give it a... On Foyne Associates. 
Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hotspots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. News of the mural went viral when Big Boy himself gave a shout out on Instagram. You can find it tucked away in a back parking lot in Lil' Five Points. An Atlanta icon, ever changing, always interesting. The Crog Street Tunnel is full of artwork from some pristy, eclectic Atlanta artists. You always feel it's good vibes. When you vibe with it, it's a good time. We don't worry about the hate, we just pass it to the side. There's graffiti, community messages, concert announcements. You really never know what you're gonna get here, and that's what makes it so special. You can find it between Cabbage Town and Inman Park. If you've never checked it out, it's a must-see. There are hundreds of works of art along the Beltline. I'm talking murals, sculptures, photography. This beautiful mural was created by the artist Hintz. It's 100 feet long, and even though it was created in 2014, it still remains very popular to musicians and photographers alike. You can find it on the East Side Trail under Virginia Avenue. So let me know what you think. It doesn't have to be street art. Maybe your favorite spot is down the street from your home or a great view. Connect with me on Facebook and Instagram and share your favorite Instagram spots in Atlanta. And come hang out with me on Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. I haven't seen you in a while. Where you been? It looks like fun. It they does. are fun. <laughs> they're and they're convenient. Fun. Yeah. But they're being dumped everywhere. 5,000 scooters at one time active throughout the city. I enjoy them myself. They're fun. Yeah. There's got to be some regulations. That's I just feel the like thing. they have to evolve with the times, though. They're not mm -hmm. going anywhere. They shouldn't go anywhere. It's a yeah. new way of transporting. Yeah. We have to evolve. I'm going to be looking for you now. President Trump in town for a tour of the CDC as government and health officials try to stave off the spread of the coronavirus here in the United States. Joining me now, Chuck Todd, moderator of Meet the Press. Chuck, both the president and the vice president have done their best to try and reassure the public about the coronavirus. Do you think that they've been using an effective strategy so far? Well, look, I think um, I think the vice president and the and the and the team um, that he's now leading have, have, have tried to tried to do that. I think the, for the president himself, you know, he sometimes uh, he likes to take matters into his own hands. Uh, and I think it, whether he means to or not, he certainly has delivered what appears to be mixed messages at times. What the vice president and the task force say and what the president says sometimes come across as two different things. And then the president might clean it up and say, oh, his words were misinterpreted. But I think there is a concern that there is a bit of perceived uncertainty at the top. In some ways, he, he sees it, some things through the prism of what this means for him, the reelect, and all of those things. And I think that that's, that's where he's got to be careful. And if people can tell him this, that in a re-election year, if he looks like he is making decisions based on how this looks uh, through the prism of the campaign, I think that's where he risks actually acquiring more political problems. This is a case where stepping back behind those in the lab coats is probably uh, the best politics he could practice here. All right, let's kind of shift gears a little bit. Georgia's primary just about 18 days away from now. Pretty much a two-horse race in the Democratic Party. It the big favorite, Joe Biden, right now. What can Bernie Sanders do to overcome what happened, uh, what we saw on Super Tuesday? He needs to have something dramatic that I have no idea what that would be. That's my point here, meaning, like, I don't think there's anything he can do. I think if, if everything continues to break demographically, that it broke on Super Tuesday, then it's very difficult for Sanders to find a path to this nomination. And in fact, I don't know if Georgia's going to be relevant by the time the primary comes on March 24th. When you look at the states between now and Georgia's primary on March 24th, put it this way, if this is still a race come March 24th, then something dramatic has happened. And Bernie Sanders has won in places that no one expected him to win. And then all of a sudden, you know, we've got a new contest. But let's be realistic. 
We already saw what South Carolina did. We already saw what Alabama did. We already saw what Tennessee did. Have I described three states that border Georgia? We have an idea of what's going to happen in Florida. It's hard to imagine Georgia's going to be that competitive. Um, but if it is, by the time it comes around, then something dramatic that we have, we have not foreseen has happened. My point is, that's how difficult I think this path is right now for Bernie Sanders. All right, Chuck, thank you so much. Meet the Press Air Sunday at 10 a.m. right here on 11 Live. Chuck, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Jennifer. Coming up. You know, it's, you lose your home. That's hard. Homeowners losing their homes to the community designed to protect its value. I didn't know how it was stacking up. I knew. Just knew it was a lot. I knew it was a lot. A reveal investigation coming up on prime time on the ATL. Once you allow it, right, then it sets you up for the entire week where you just have lost it. Like on, a, on a Sunday, it's like, oh, let's just order some Chinese food. And of course, you wind up eating tons of that. And then on Monday, you're like, well, I got leftovers. I can't let it go. Oh, and Auntie wants to give you a plate to take home from the barbecue. Uh, Auntie. No. <laughs> Auntie, don't invite me to the barbecue. I'm going to be looking for you next time. So use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekday, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. The 11 Alive app is your go-to source for all things Atlanta. You hear what happened today? I'll tell you all about it. Breaking news the moment it happens. The Boyle Water Advisory. Hyper-local, accurate weather alert. You may want to grab that sweater, maybe even a coat. More stories to uncover. More videos to discover. He did it his way. Personalized for you. And that's what makes it so special. The 11 Alive app. Available now in the App Store. Hey, I got the ways to go. I got moves to make. Call me, but I stay in the flow. So you to do what I say. No, 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 You can assume what you're doing with freedom. Oh, and so I was saying, there is always something filming here in Atlanta. From movies to TV shows, you name it. And so the A scene keeps up with all of it for you. Casting calls, which big celebrities are in town, what's filming, and if it's in your neighborhood. It's like an inside scoop. Oh, nice. But you know, I really wish you would have told us we were filming this. Today, Ooh. did I not text you? All right. Ah, it's in my drafts. That's my bad. <laughs> So you slept in and you missed morning rush, huh? Well, here's what you missed. In my experience, good guys do finish last. Mm. Oh, I, I consider nice myself guy. a nice guy. Yeah, I've like got the most beautiful woman in the world in my eyes. You're a nice guy too, yeah. Jeff. I'm saying in my experience, when growing up, good guys didn't oh, finish last. Oh, Somebody <laughs> broke his heart somewhere along the line. We're here every weekday morning, so come on, hang out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. You didn't get my text? The whole crew got together for coffee this morning. I'm, I'm learning the taste of water, because I'm, I'm sugary. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Right, right. About I mean, that. One reward would be. Slimming down. Okay, yes. yeah, right, yeah, okay. Yeah. A little water yes. in my cup. And, and beautiful skin. Well, you know, even too. more beautiful skin, you know. Welcome to The Reveal on Prime Time. I'm investigator Rebecca Lindstrom. You buy something, it's yours. But that's not always the case when it comes to your home. Homeowner associations have the right to foreclose and kick you to the street if you fail to pay your dues. But the women you're about to meet say that tool is being abused, used instead to bully homeowners into paying debts they don't understand. Okay, here's me calling. When Patricia Quigley calls her HOA's property management company, she gets this message. The number you dialed is not a working number. But call from any other phone number. Thank you for calling Access Management Group. You're blocked. In 2010, Quigley, upset with her HOA's billing process, decided to take a stand and refused to pay her dues, about $700 that year. But that only led to letters from Lozega and Johansson, the law firm hired to collect on the debt. 
and that debt had grown. Walked in, paid him the $2,700, and when I walked out, I said, this is all I owe, right? Yes. But it wasn't all you owed? No. Shortly after, she received another bill for $3,000. She called and sent letters trying to figure out why. But all Quigley says she got in return were cryptic statements, dates with amounts that didn't make any sense to her. Then here comes the next set of letters. And now it's up to 6400 Turns out there were post-judgment legal fees and 18% back interest. So even after she'd paid more than $9,000, she was still somehow behind on her dues. But in 2018, she received the most shocking letter of all, an eviction notice. You know, it's, you lose your home. That's hard. But sadness turned to anger when she realized the HOA had purchased her home through foreclosure for $3.24 a year before she was evicted. So you had been living in your house for a year, but you didn't legally own your house. No. Quigley says not only did the HOA accept her dues payment on a house she apparently did not own, but allowed her to make another $4,600 in home loan payments before getting kicked out. She paid she a debt she did not owe. Yes, that's for sure, and okay. they don't have to give it back. Attorney George Nowak has helped craft George's HOA laws since the 1980s. He says Quigley's story is tragic, but it is a tragedy of her own making. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. In a back room and blue smoke and mirrors. Nowak says the HOA can't win a judgment until the homeowner owes at least $2,000. The court must perform a title search, have the foreclosure posted in the paper for a month, and the homeowner served. They brought this on because they ignored all of the requests to pay. They didn't show up at the trial most times. You want some more? Quigley admits she never more. did go to court, not understanding the process or the stakes involved. But Phoenicia Law, a homeowner in Douglas County, did try to fight the HOA's claims against her. When they garnished my bank account, I was unemployed. Law owns a home in the Rosewood Community Association. She received a payment plan to catch up on her dues, but there were a few added fees she didn't understand. I didn't know how it was stacking up. I knew. You just knew it was a lot. I knew it was a lot. She disputed the bill in court, appealing to the judge for help. These exhibits I sent to the court. But court records say Law's dispute arrived one day too late. So the judge couldn't consider issues like this check, an HOA payment mailed in vain. Clearly returned to sender seven times. But the kicker, after she lost the case, she was told to mail her settlement payment to that same address. And this time, the check didn't come back. While it's portrayed as cold and you're taking advantage of the homeowner, it's the exact opposite. People who don't pay their assessments are having everybody else in the community subsidize them. Georgia law fiercely protects an HOA's right to collect what is owed, but neither of these women deny their debt. What they do have a problem with is the inability to mediate and ask questions when a disagreement arises. A lot of times, people can't afford to fight. They just have to walk away. According to the Community Association Institute, six states have some type of ombudsman to help educate and facilitate these discussions. And several states require mediation before a lawsuit is filed. Georgia isn't one of them. After Quigley was evicted, the reveal learned her HOA sold the house to an employee at the law firm involved in her foreclosure. That really bothers me because how could that not be illegal? According to public documents, Legacy Investment Properties, a company that didn't legally exist at the time, bought the house for $1 and a portion of the profits. The woman behind the LLC then reactivated her real estate license and sold the home to a new family. I've never heard a story like that before. Well, the HOA and law firm recouped their money and the LLC likely made some. She, this cat's tougher than... Quigley ended up homeless, losing tens of thousands of dollars in equity. The courts have said there is no legitimate reason for not paying. If you believe the association has done you wrong, then sue the association. Pay it. And, and sue, sue the, the association. association. Every time we air a story related to HOAs, we receive a flurry of emails, people frustrated with something going on in their own community. But so far, Georgia lawmakers have shown no interest in creating an ombudsman office or even studying the issue. 
You can see more in-depth investigations like this one by going to our website, 11alive.com. And don't forget to watch The Reveal, the only local investigation show in the country. It's Sundays at 6 on our sister station, 11 Alive. We had windy conditions out there today, and we had sporadic reports of some trees down in some areas. You know, it wasn't storming or anything. It's just the wind that came in with this system that's bringing in the colder air. And because of the ground being so saturated and so wet and so soggy, a lot of the roots just weren't able to hold up some of these trees with those windy conditions. And this is an example of this. This was uh, posted uh, from the Cherokee County Emergency Management Agency's page. Uh, and this is just to the south of ball ground. And they were saying that this tree just kind of toppled over and uh, hit these power lines. So we had other reports of some trees down around uh, as well. It wasn't really that widespread, but just a few of those sporadic trees down. And we still have some winds out there at this hour, 21 mile an hour winds here in Atlanta. Outside the city, not quite as windy. We have 10 mile an hour winds in Carrollton, but 17 mile an hour winds in Peachtree City. We're gonna see these winds still with us tonight, but beginning to calm down a little bit more tomorrow. And I think you're gonna like the weekend. If you like today, nice and dry with sunshine, we're gonna repeat that here tomorrow. It's going to be a dry weekend. We'll also see those temperatures gradually warming. Today's high was 58. We'll be up to around 60 tomorrow and then mid 60s on Sunday. But then the showers, they're gonna return moving into next week. The good news is it's not gonna be the type of rain like we had earlier this week when it was almost flooding type rain, but still some showers next week. And we're gonna break that down for you with those chances and the timeline coming up in our seven day outlook. President Trump joined thousands of volunteers in Tennessee today as recovery efforts continue in the wake of two deadly tornadoes. At least two dozen people were killed after an EF4 and an EF3 tornado hit the outskirts of Nashville Tuesday. As teams clean up miles of debris, they are also uncovering amazing stories of survival. Jay Gray shares one of them tonight. President Trump on the ground in Middle Tennessee getting a first-hand look at the devastation, thanking first responders and promising assistance for survivors as the cleanup and recovery begin. God be with them, and we're going to be with them. We're going to be with them all the way. Thousands of volunteers in and around Nashville aren't waiting for federal help. They've been working here since the winds died down. Seeing all the devastation right now is pretty surreal, and realizing these are people's lives, and it's been turned upside down, and seeing people come, it gives me hope that, you know, they are... They can rebuild. As they continue to sift through what the storms left behind, there are also now amazing stories of survival emerging from all the twisted metal and broken glass. I seen something hit the side of the car and all the windows bust out and felt the car start to lift up off the ground. But at that point, it all just went into a blur. This is their car now. As it was tossed 60 yards or so in the air, Amber Bingham dove from the passenger seat to the back to protect her little girl. I just grabbed her head and I shoved it down and I just got over her and I just held her. And if I wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't be here because there's nothing left in my passenger seat. There's not much left of their community either, but right now. Oh my gosh. I'm blessed to be here. There's no other place they'd rather be. Topping our speed feed tonight, a Marietta man accused of choking, headbutting, and trying to kill a woman. 32-year-old Damian Rodriguez Pavone was arrested today. According to the arrest warrant, he held a woman against a bed, choking her and yelling he was going to kill her. It also says that he headbutted her three times and broke her nose, then wouldn't leave her apartment. According to the, to the warrant here, the victim was able to escape and call police when Pavone was in the bathroom. He's now facing multiple felony charges. A Conyers police officer is back home after he was hurt in a crash yesterday morning. The Georgia State Patrol says the officer, Eric Green, was driving with his lights activated through a red light. This is at Georgia 138 and Flats Shoals Road, but switched lanes before he got out of the intersection. Another driver was going through the green light at the same time, slammed it to him. Officer Green's car then hit another vehicle. The officer was taken to the hospital, but is now resting at home. The driver that hit the patrol car had minor injuries. UGA star Anthony Edwards says no autographs, please. But this is for a good reason. 
Anthony Edwards tweeted that he appreciates his fans and supporters, but uh, he's taking the CDC's advice and stop shaking hands and signing autographs to help prevent the spread of coronavirus. The NBA has already advised players to fist bump with fans instead of the high five. An 11 year old cuffed and questioned by police right in front of her mother. She says it was a bad mistake. Now she's taking action. We know you have questions and concerns. We know there's fear, but when fear drives us, we overreact and underprepare. So here's our promise to you as 11 Alive covers coronavirus. We promise that fear will never be our goal. We'll find the best experts and ask informed questions. We'll hold the powerful accountable to answer them. We'll bring you context and perspective to numbers that are always changing. We will always try our best to answer all of your questions. And if you're not getting the information you need or think there are other stories we need to share, please let us know. We are here to serve you, our community, with facts to help you prepare, be safe, and have some peace of mind. Is down the street from your home or a great view. Connect with me on Facebook and Instagram and share your favorite Instagram spots in Atlanta. And come hang out with me on Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. I haven't seen you in a while. Where you been? It looks like fun. It they does. are fun. <laughs> they're and they're convenient. Fun. Yeah. But they're being dumped everywhere. 5,000 scooters at one time active throughout the city. I enjoy them myself. They're fun. Yeah. There's got to be some regulations. That's I just feel the like thing. they have to evolve with the times, though. They're not mm -hmm. going anywhere. They shouldn't go anywhere. It's a yeah. new way of transporting. Yeah. We have to evolve. I'm going to be looking for you next time, so use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. You see them all day, every day. Headlines, stats, and numbers, but without context, they're just clickbait. So let's add some perspective. The three most interesting numbers of the day, what they mean, and why they're important. News and numbers on Uplink. What's the best part about Your voice, it is never too loud or too much. Your voice has the power to tell it like it is. Bringing us together to act. Together, our voices grow. Together we come alive, amplifying voices and breaking down barriers to change the story and shape the future. Together we are unstoppable. Together we are where Atlanta speaks. Remember the old days, the old cliffhangers when we used to watch shows? Hey, and they cliffhangers. Would, you know, they yeah. didn't wait the next week. Ah. You're, oh, what's going to happen to the $6 million man? He was hanging with his one bionic arm. Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m. Only on 11 Alive. Atlanta, almost 6 million people call the Metro home. But what makes this place so great? I'm 11 Alive's Chesley McNeil. I'm going to give you three reasons why Atlanta is the best city in America. Come on, man, it's the heart of the South. And it's one of the most diverse cities around. People from all walks of life have come here and made it home from different backgrounds, languages, and religions. And who can forget about the food? They all make this a cultural melting pot full of great people and Southern hospitality. Atlanta's rich history is unmatched, known as the cradle of the civil rights movement for good reason. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Andrew Young, John Lewis, they all fought in the struggle for equal rights right here. Businesses on Sweet Auburn Avenue, local black churches, and college students from Atlanta all helped shape the future of America. Once an Olympic city, Atlanta's home to the best sports scene across the nation. Hey look, the South has something to say. You won't find more passionate fans in the This is a scary moment for any parent out there. An 11-year-old DeKalb County girl taken away in handcuffs as her mom watched. The girl's mother says police mistakenly detained her daughter while investigating an attempted car break-in. She tells Joe Henke she now plans to file a formal complaint with DeKalb County Police. Livid at DeKalb Police Department for detaining my 11-year-old for traumatizing my 11 year old. Centria Hendricks says her doorbell camera recorded DeKalb County police handcuffing her daughter. Yes ma'am, she's been detained right now. 
And a second camera captured the girl being put in a squad car. I know she's terrified. You know, again, she is a strong little girl, but this is overwhelming. Hendrick says her daughter came home around 4 p.m. on Wednesday, and the cameras do not show the girl ever leaving. Police knocked on their door around 740. They say that someone broke into, attempted to break into a car um, up the street. He said it was a girl and two young men. The incident happened earlier in the hour, according to Hendricks, and she said police were looking for a 16-year-old girl with her daughter's name who ran toward her home. She believes a neighbor mistakenly gave an officer the 11-year-old's name, so she opened the security camera app on her phone for police. Despite me having video footage that shows that my daughter did not exit our home, you're still going to arrest her off something that someone said. The girl spent around 10 minutes in handcuffs and in the police car long enough to leave her in fear. She was afraid that the police were going to come back to her school and arrest her. Hendrick says a detective learned the girl in the car was 11, not 16, and let her go. A DeKalb police spokeswoman today said they were not aware of any concerns, but will look into it. Hendrick says she wants changes for how DeKalb PD handle children. Let's do our due diligence. Let's make sure that everything is, is good before, before we go to someone's house. Temperatures today, we're trending a little bit below where we should be for this time of year. We topped off at 58 degrees for a high this afternoon. A lot of sunshine. It was kind of breezy, though. I mentioned earlier our peak wind gust was 38 miles an hour today. That 58 degree high temperature today is about four degrees below the average. We should be around 62 for a high temperature for this time of year. Tomorrow, we're going to be a little bit closer to that. We'll be around 60 for high tomorrow and then on Sunday, I think we'll actually be a little bit above average when we get up into the mid 60s. Our low this morning was 41. We're loving seeing the goose eggs right here. That means no rain in our area today. And now our surplus is about 12 and three quarters inches above where we should be in rainfall. So yeah, I think we deserve a break uh, and we're going to see some drier conditions here, not only for today like we had today, but also into Saturday and Sunday. The wind is still kind of brisk out there in some spots. Not everybody is still getting windy conditions, but we still have some winds like here in Atlanta at 21 miles an hour, 17 mile an hour winds in Peachtree City. Lower winds, though, in Duluth, less than 10 miles an hour, Athens, less than 10 mile an hour winds. And uh, we'll see those winds dying down during the day tomorrow, but we're still going to be rather breezy in the morning. And with the temperature right now of 46 with those breezes, it feels a little bit cooler in the morning. Our temperature gets down to around 33 degrees and we'll still have some breezes, so it's going to feel even colder with the wind chill. Uh, air temperatures, actual temperatures right now are 41 here in town, 41 in Canton, 35 in Blairsville, 32 in Clayton. Compare that to 50 at this hour in Peachtree City. We have a wide range of those temperatures out there. Here's the hour by hour forecast for tomorrow, starting at 9 o'clock. Now, I think it's 7. It'll be 33 degrees, then by 8 o'clock, maybe 35, by 9 o'clock, 37, and then watch how we move up. Now, this model is saying mid-50s. I think it's going to be a little warmer than that. I think we'll get up to 60 degrees for a high, but what I want you to see here, look at all the sunshine. We're going to have clear skies. Those winds will be dying down, so it's going to be feeling pretty nice out there. Here's that high of 60 degrees, mostly sunny skies after that chilly start and warming pretty nicely. And then on Sunday, it'll be chilly again to start, not as cold, but down to about 37 degrees, and then we get up to about 63 to 65 degrees on Sunday afternoon, still with mostly sunny skies. Here's the forecast track, and not a lot showing up here on the forecast track for the weekend, and that's a good thing. But I want you to notice, though, this blue line, I know it's kind of jagged here. Uh, that's that's the freezing line. Everybody north of that and over here to the in West Georgia, that's where we think that we're going to see temperatures that get too freezing or maybe a little bit below. And then to the east, we think it'll be a little bit above the freezing mark. But in the afternoon, a lot of sunshine, uh, continued sun sunshine on Saturday afternoon as well. Clear Saturday night into Sunday, looking great Sunday too. A couple of more clouds may, may build in, and then on Monday, the clouds will thicken up a little bit more, increasing clouds, highs near 66. Then on Tuesday, 50% chance for showers. Wednesday and Thursday, a 40% chance for showers, then down to a 30% chance for showers on Friday. These rain chances, I know when you see the raindrops on here, you're thinking, oh no, this is going to be like it was earlier in the week. No, these are just going to be showers. It's not going to be the persistent heavy rain like we were dealing with early in the week. We're just talking about scattered showers for the middle and end of the week.
The final venue for the 2020 Olympics is now complete. That is the building bringing us closer to the Summer Olympic Games in Tokyo. Organizers say work on the Aquatic Center was finished in February, meaning that all the venues built for this year's Olympics have been completed on time. The Aquatic Center, will, which will host swimming and diving events, was one of eight new venues built this summer for the Olympics. In addition to the Athletes Village, a total of 43 venues will be used during the Tokyo 2020 Games. Okay, but to put this all into perspective, this news comes as a coronavirus outbreak has raised a lot of questions about whether the Games will be postponed or canceled. Over the past few days, the Japanese government has been insistent the competition will go on as scheduled. That's right. 11 Alive Sports Alex Glaze sat down with two Olympians today to talk about some of their concerns. He would tell you that he's training just for today. But the truth is, Eric Kennard is training for Tokyo. And while he's focused on his training, he's also aware of how the coronavirus is starting to affect sports and could possibly affect the 2020 Olympic Games. Now, are you worried about the coronavirus? I don't possess a spirit of fear. You've known me for a long time. You know, I, you know, I don't possess a spirit of fear in that case. I am not ignorant to the risk associated with being sick. Um, and I know the statistics involving the sickness. This isn't the first time a global health scare has threatened to impact the Olympics. In 2016, the Zika virus was the it's big always thing. Something, man. There, it's it was, always that something. was the big thing, yeah, and that was something. going into the Rio yeah, game. Yeah, so, yeah, do, not, do you remember the yeah. fear going into that? And does this kind of feel similar? Or does this feel different? This is a little different. Uh, this is, as far as global, you know, panic and fear, that exists around this. That, and it didn't exist around you know, the Zika virus, influenza is, you know, that's airborne, you know what I mean? Like, that's totally different. As the coronavirus continues to spread, sports leagues around the world are adjusting, and sporting events without fans may soon be the new normal. Have you thought about the possibility of the Olympics not having any spectators? That'd be extremely weird. I don't think that that would ever happen. It's the biggest sporting event in the world. Have you thought about the possibility of the Olympics being canceled? No, no, I just don't think it will happen. Um, so I haven't really entertained that possibility. What makes you say that, that you don't think it would happen? You're talking money, you know. Like that's a lot of money, a lot of preparation taking place. I think a delay uh, is a little more appropriate as far as preparing for what they have to deal with and what the world is dealing with as far as the sickness is, is concerned. So while the games are still going on as scheduled, organizers announced they will be scaling back on the torch uh, relay, which is going to begin on March 26. Each torch bearer will also have their temperature tested before running. We'll have more when we come back. Weekdays 5 to 7 a.m. only on 11 Alive. Atlanta, almost 6 million people call the Metro home. But what makes this place so great? I'm 11 Live's Chesley McNeil. I'm gonna give you three reasons why Atlanta is the best city in America. Come on, man, it's the heart of the South. And it's one of the most diverse cities around. People from all walks of life have come here and made it home from different backgrounds, languages, and religions. And who can forget about the food? They all make this a cultural melting pot full of great people and Southern hospitality. Atlanta's rich history is unmatched, known as the cradle of the civil rights movement for good reason. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Andrew Young, John Lewis, they all fought in the struggle for equal rights right here. Businesses on Sweet Auburn Avenue, local black churches, and college students from Atlanta all helped shape the future of America. Once an Olympic city, Atlanta's home to the best sports scene across the nation. Hey look, the South has something to say. You won't find more passionate fans anywhere. From the Atlanta Braves home run king, my man, Hank Aaron, to the human highlight film, Hawks Dominique Wilkins, some of the greatest athletes have come through Atlanta. We're talking the Falcons, the Braves, the Hawks, the MLS champs, Atlanta United. This city has something for every kind of sports fan. So what do you think? Is Atlanta the best city in America? Connect with us, use Facebook or Instagram and tell us why this city's got it going on. And then watch us every weekday morning from five to seven on the Morning Rush on 11 Alive. Newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Babe, where are my keys? Uh, where's my lunch? Where's my phone? Hey, where's my blue shirt?
Where's my pen? Have you seen it? Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. <laughs> It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foyne Associates. I woke up at 2 in the morning to be here. Where were you? Once you allow it, right, then it sets you up for the entire week where you just have lost it. Like on, a, on a Sunday, it's like, oh, let's just order some Chinese food. And, of course, you wind up eating tons of that. And then on Monday, you're like, well, I got leftovers. I can't let it go. Oh, and Auntie wants to give you a plate to take home from the barbecue. Auntie. Yeah. Auntie, don't invite me to the barbecue. <laughs> I'm going to be looking for you next time. So use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. The 11 Alive app is your go-to source for all things Atlanta. You hear what happened today? I'll tell you all about it. Breaking news the moment it happened. Man, I can't wait till the weekend to get here because we're just a day away. Exactly. <laughs> Hours away where it's going to be nice and dry. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Hey, more primetime news coming up at 10 o'clock. Of an Alive app. Available now in the App Store. Hey, I got the ways to go. I got moves to make. Call me, but I stay in the flow. So yeah, just do what I say. No, 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 You can assume Oh, and so I was saying, there is always something filming here in Atlanta. From movies to TV shows, you name it. And so the A scene keeps up with all of it for you. Casting calls, which big celebrities are in town, what's filming, and if it's in your neighborhood. It's like an inside scoop. Oh, nice. But you know, I really wish you would have told us we were filming this. Today, Ooh, did I not text you? All right. Ah, it's in my drafts. That's my bad. So you slept in and you missed morning rush, huh? Well, here's what you missed. In my experience, good guys do finish last. Mm -hmm. I, I consider nice myself guy. a nice guy. Yeah. Yeah. I've got the most beautiful woman in the world in my eyes. You're a nice guy too, yeah. Chess. I'm saying in my experience, when growing up, good guys didn't oh, finish last. Oh, Somebody <laughs> broke his heart somewhere along the line. We're here every weekday morning, so come on, hang out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Televised newscast not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. You didn't get my text? The whole crew got together for coffee this morning. I'm, I'm learning the taste of water, because I'm, I'm sugary. Oh, uh, okay. yeah. right, right. about I mean, that. Reward would be... Slimming. Slimming down. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. A little water yes. in my cup. And and beautiful skin. <laughs> well, you know, well, even too. more beautiful skin. You know, when it's all <laughs> hydrated and everything else. I'm not gonna be able to sit next to you in a few months. <laughs> Don't drink your morning coffee alone. Have it with us. Morning rush. Weekdays, five to seven a.m. Only on Eleven Alive. Some mornings, what you want isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the Rush Blog, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. Catch the Rush Blog on the Morning Rush. Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm gonna go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foyne Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hotspots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. President Trump visited the CDC in Atlanta late this afternoon, and the very latest news is that they continue to keep an eye on how things are progressing. This comes as coronavirus cases top 250 from coast to coast in the United States, reportedly hitting 100,000 worldwide. 14 people have now died in the U.S. from coronavirus. That's according to NBC News. 21 people on a cruise ship held off the coast of San Francisco have tested positive for the virus. 
While health officials say the risk is still low for most Americans, they are under mounting pressure to catch up to the demand of the testing. The president expressed confidence that the CDC is working hard to get ahead of the virus. Here is John Shirick. This was a presidential pat on the back for CDC researchers and administrators here in Atlanta and around the world who are working to detect a fast-moving coronavirus faster than it can spread. President Trump trying to reassure a worried world from inside the CDC lab that has struggled to come up with a test for coronavirus from scratch and is now racing to distribute 4 million tests across the U.S. within the next seven days to start. The testing has been amazing, actually, what they've been able to produce in such a short period of time. They heard there was a problem in China. That's when they started working on this, and that's pretty incredible. That's why we're in good shape. President Trump yeah. calling on Georgia's yeah. Governor Brian Kemp at one point to say that the CDC has now delivered the test kits to Georgia, the state now able to detect on its own anyone who might be infected fast and quarantine them. Anybody that wants a test can get a test. That's I, what I would the just say line. that we started testing in our lab in Georgia, our uh, Department of Public Health yesterday, which is a day earlier we thought it would be today. So we are actually testing today. So the governor and the president and the CDC emphasizing that the war on coronavirus in the U.S includes getting the new test to every community quickly for early detection in order to isolate those infected. I'm Jennifer Bellamy. At least 20 employees at Floyd Medical Center are under a 14-day self-quarantine after coming into contact with a patient who preliminarily tested positive for coronavirus. The patient visited the hospital twice with flu-like symptoms. The second time, hospital doctors decided to admit then keep the 46-year-old woman in isolation. One of the criteria that we've been told by public health is that six feet and 10 minutes of contact with a patient with coronavirus is an exposure. The employees now in self-quarantine will get paid while they are off work. Some of the questions that you have been asking us the most concern Georgia schools coronavirus response. During our five o'clock broadcast, I had the exclusive opportunity to speak with Atlanta Public School Superintendent Dr. Maria Kastarfin, who spoke about preparations and should Metro schools be forced to close. So we're going to lean hard on our emergency system that we use uh, on when we close school for bad weather days. Yeah. And so uh, so we've tested it and it allows us to uh, provide what we call teleschooling to students. Um, they're able to go in through the Internet and Wi-Fi and whatever, uh, you know, they may have um, as devices to see all of their expectations around academics. You can watch our full conversation on our 11 Alive YouTube page. Meanwhile, U.S. Customs and Border Protection has released the number of travelers who agents have sent for enhanced health screenings from February 2nd through March 4th. More than 63,000 travelers at U.S. ports of entry have been referred to the CDC. Most of those were airline passengers. Fewer than 800 came by land and just 113 travelers came by ship. On the average, the CDC will process more than 1 million people per day. We also have an entire special section with information about coronavirus. What you need to know, you can find that at 11alive.com slash coronavirus. Now to politics. Decision 2020 from reality television to politics. Congressman Lewis has a new Republican challenger in Georgia's 5th district race. This is the 11th time that Congressman Lewis's seat has been challenged by a Republican. New at 11, Joe Hankey introduces us to the new woman shaking things up. This is political newcomer Angela Stanton King. I'm not perfect, but I have passion. The author is a former felon pardoned by President Donald Trump last month. Stanton King finished serving her sentence in 2007 following a federal conspiracy charges conviction. She, or any candidate, of course, faces an uphill battle against a 17-term incumbent congressman and civil rights icon. I never uh, considered not running. Representative John Lewis qualified Monday to run for an 18th consecutive term in Congress. He announced his stage 4 pancreatic cancer fight in December. I'm getting better. I'm feeling good. Feel stronger and stronger. Stanton King says she respects Lewis's legacy in Atlanta, D.C., and to the civil rights movement, but believes the time is now for a different voice. But these are no longer the days of 
marching over the Selma Bridge. There's a different injustice we're fighting now. The injustice she sees created her platform, which focuses on pro-life job creation for minorities and criminal justice reform. Advocate for others to be free, like recently released uh, Crystal Munoz and Chinese Hall. These are women that have been serving life sentences for nonviolent crime. A White House statement on her pardon reads, she works tirelessly to improve re-entry outcomes for people returning to their communities upon release from prison. I want to take what I have and what I've learned over the years and give it back to my community. As far as reality TV, Angela Stanton King was in some Real Housewives of Atlanta episodes and shows on BET before he could face any Republican challenger. Representative Lewis right now is scheduled to face a single Democratic challenger, Barrington Martin, in a May primary. Jeff. All right, Joe, we continue on the political front. The list of options for Georgia's junior U.S. Senate seat continues to expand today. Reverend Raphael Warnock of Ebenezer officially entered the contest against Senator Kelly Leffler. This is a critical moment in the history of our country. So many people are depending on us. Raphael Warnock is one of several Democrats hoping to win November's special election and take the seat formerly held by Senator Johnny Isaacson. Governor Kemp appointed the Republican Leffler, who also faces a challenge from fellow Republican Congressman Doug Collins. Georgia's other Senate seat also up for grabs this year. The incumbent, David Perdue, so far unopposed in May's Republican primary on the Democratic ticket. John Ossoff will face the former Columbus Mayor Teresa Tomlinson, Executive Sarah Riggs Emico, Air Force veteran James Knox, and three others. The Secretary of State is challenging Athens Clark County's decision to stop using Georgia's new voting machines. The local election board said the new machines could not guarantee that someone's ballot would be secret because they're too large and too bright. The county decided to use paper ballots for presidential primary voting instead. But the Secretary of State is meeting with the state elections board on Wednesday to see if that move breaks any state law. The Fannin County Tax Commissioner arrested for allegedly forging signatures to steal property. Her name is Shirley Sosevi. She is 63. She was arrested Thursday on forgery and violation of oath charges. The GBI says Sosevi forged a signature on a deed to a transfer title for property she was trying to get for her family. That investigation is far from being over. It is chilly out there. We still have some wind, and you can see that wind that's blowing out there by the arrows that we're showing. And it's going to be chilly in the morning, starting off with temperatures around freezing. But look at this. The colder air starts to retreat, and that means it'll be replaced by warmer air. Stay with us. We'll talk about that gradual warming trend for the weekend. Still ahead on this International Women's Day, Georgia lawmakers working to make things better for women in our state. We are breaking down how these bills could help. Up. And and beautiful skin, well, you know, well, even too. more beautiful skin, you know, when it's all <laughs> hydrated and everything else. I'm not gonna be able to sit next to you in a few months. <laughs> Don't drink your morning coffee alone. Have it with us. Morning Rush weekdays, five to seven a.m. Only on Eleven Alive. Some mornings, what you want isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the Rush Block, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. Catch the Rush Block on the Morning Rush. Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your Morning Rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hotspots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. News of the mural went viral when Big Boy himself gave a shout out on Instagram. You can find it tucked away in a back parking lot in Little Five Points. An Atlanta icon, ever changing, always interesting. The Crog Street Tunnel is full of artwork from some pristy, eclectic Atlanta artists. You always feel is good vibe. When you vibe with it, it's a good time. We don't worry about the hate, we just pass it to the side. There's graffiti, community messages, concert announcements. You really never know what you're going to get here, and that's what makes it so special. There's big plans for big moves under the Gold Dome, several pieces 
of proposed legislation highlight the need for improvement in the lives of women in Georgia. Here's 11 Alive's Latasha Givens walking us through the proposals and their impacts. As we prepare to celebrate International Women's Day this weekend, we wanted to take a look at some legislation lawmakers say already has and could enhance the lives of women right here in Georgia. It's a great time for women. Representative Sandra Scott says on the 100th anniversary year of women's right to vote, 2020 will also be another year of empowerment for women. We are really stepping up to the plate. And she says it starts in the home, which is why some recent bills address the maternal and infant mortality rate in our state. We're seeking a study committee to try to find out the source and the sole reason we look at this as an epidemic. Other bills hope to expand Medicaid coverage for new mothers from two months to six months. Time and financial resources, Representative Sharon Cooper says new moms need. You know, we're asking employers to make uh, accommodations for mothers who want to pump. And last year, a lactation room was added at the Georgia Capitol. Other legislation advocates for more paid maternity leave. The state is now for our state employees, and that is our teachers uh, in the university system and state employees, that they will have three weeks paid leave after delivering to start, you know, building that family togetherness and all. Georgia is a place to do business. And Representative Scott says women should also benefit, so she introduced House Bill 922 that would give a tax credit for women who own small businesses. Since last session, other bills introduced the lawmakers say could also benefit women, one that would eliminate the tax on feminine products, and another bill would mandate doctors give women extra information during breast exams. And we're keeping an eye on some of those bills mentioned in this story. We'll keep you updated on the outcome. We have a team of 11 Alive journalists dedicated to covering the political issues that matter most to you during this election year. Be sure to check our special politics section of 11alive.com. We saw the sun a little bit today. It was blustery. Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb is here with our weekend forecast. Yeah, we still have that wind out there uh, that is blowing, but not as strong as it was earlier. Jeff, we had a 38 mile an hour peak wind gust earlier today, uh, so things are a little bit quieter. In fact, before I overlay the numbers, you can see where we see the blues here around Atlanta over to the east and also in North Georgia. That corresponds with some of those stronger winds. 12 mile an hour winds right now in Rome, 14 mile an hour winds in Marietta, Atlanta. We're at 15 mile an hour winds. We got the tens over in Carrollton and Peachtree City and Gainesville, but other spots we have winds that are less than 10 miles an hour. Now when you add in the gust that comes up just a little bit and we're going to see these wind gusts during the nighttime hours starting to come down a little bit in the morning. We'll talk about 17 mile an hour wind gusts, but we really think that these wind gusts in the morning will be less than 20 miles an hour. So that's not going to be as blustery as it was earlier today. As I mentioned, when we had that peak wind at 38 miles an hour and then look what happens if you're tired of the wind. If you're thinking, you know, today would just be so perfect if it wasn't breezy. Well, tomorrow it's going to die down and we'll see plenty of sunshine tomorrow and we won't have to deal with the wind at least tomorrow afternoon. Still a little breezy in the morning though. And then by evening, look at this. Many areas will have calm conditions and not much wind at all. Now look at these temperatures. It's chilly out there tonight up in North Georgia. It's colder. We've got 32 in Clayton, 34 in Blairsville, north of I-20, generally low 40s to some mid 40s and then south of I-20 generally there the mid 40s. We had a couple of 50s on the map earlier, but now everybody's back down into the 40s. So it's going to be chilly through the nighttime hours. We'll see plenty of clear skies out there and those temperatures start moving back down into the 30s and we'll bottom out in the morning right at about 33 degrees outside the city. I do think that some of you will actually see temperatures that'll be at 32, maybe a little bit below freezing. We're going to go with a 10 on the wasometer. This is our scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. Not quite perfect because it's going to be so chilly in the morning at 33. That's going to be way below the average. But then the afternoon temperatures, they'll be feeling pretty nice. That'll be just a couple of degrees below the average. Let me show you what we're watching with the models going through the extended period because we are going to see the rain chances coming back. But what I want to show you here is that the rain chances that are coming back later this week are not like what we had earlier this week. It's not going to be that consistent heavy rain. You can see here on Sunday we're still dry, but maybe a few clouds mix in with the sunshine. 
On Monday, the clouds will be a little bit thicker, but still no rain. Uh, that southerly flow is really going to help to warm things up a good bit. And then on Tuesday, that's when we're going to see the showers move in. And, and that's the key word, showers, not a persistent rain. It's just going to be spotty, scattered showers that'll move through. Yeah, hit, hit and miss variety, but it's going to be kind of off and on, not on the whole time. And then on Wednesday, you see a few scattered showers around, but there will be some dry hours at times. Same thing on Thursday. We even see those rain chances coming down a little bit as we head toward the end of the week. Most of the rain chances will be a little bit higher more in North Georgia and then persisting a little bit into next Saturday. Again, not a widespread coverage of rain, just some scattered showers. So when you see this seven day outlook, you're going to see a lot of raindrops for the middle and into the end of the week. But again, it's not going to be like what we were dealing with at the beginning of the week. 60 degrees for a high on Saturday, mostly sunny skies. Sunday also mostly sunny and a little warmer up to 65. Don't forget before you go to bed on Saturday nights, be sure to move your clock ahead one hour. We're springing forward into daylight saving time. On Monday, we see a few more of those clouds building in, but still uh, not calling for any rain chances. And then Tuesday, that 50% chance for showers, 40% Wednesday and Thursday, then down a little bit to 30% Friday. And this is going to feel nice, though. Even we're going to have some scattered showers. Temperatures will be in the 70s for the middle and end of the week. Chris, thank you. The Forsyth County Jails Pups with Purpose program launched a few months ago. Now two of the most recent graduates are in need of loving forever homes. This is Lizzie. She spent over a year in the animal shelter. This is Stella. She's a husky mix. She's right over a year old. Beautiful dogs. The program pairs dogs like Lizzie and Stella with carefully chosen inmates who work with a volunteer dog trainer to teach them obedience and other good behavior. The hope is the inmates learn how to care for the animals. The dogs then are eventually adopted. But so far, there have not been any, any applications to bring Lizzie or Stella home. So Pups with a Purpose, waiving adoption fees for both dogs if you tell them you saw it on 11 Alive. To learn more about the program and how to adopt, visit the My Coming News section on 11alive.com. I'm Francesca Emmerker with the A Scene, and guess what? I got a chance to sit down with actor Ben Affleck and the cast of The Way Back about the inspirational new basketball film about redemption. And I even uncovered some very hidden talents. You do not want to miss this interview. It's coming up next in the AC. The Live's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. You didn't get my text? The whole crew got together for coffee this morning. I'm, I'm learning the taste of water because I'm, I'm sugary. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. About I mean, that. Reward would be slimming, slimming down. Okay. Yes. Right, yeah, okay. Yeah. A little water yes. in my cup. And, and beautiful skin. Well, you well, know, I even too. more beautiful skin, you know, when it's all <laughs> hydrated and everything else. It's not going to be able to sit next to you in a few months. <laughs> Don't drink your morning coffee alone. Have it with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Some mornings what you want isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the Rush Block, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. Catch the Rush Block on the Morning Rush. Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foyne Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hot spots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. News of the mural went viral when Big Boy himself gave a shout out on Instagram. You can find it tucked away in a back parking lot in Little Five Points. An Atlanta icon, ever changing, always interesting. The Crog Street Tunnel is full of artwork from some pretty eclectic Atlanta artists. You always feel is good vibe. When you vibe with it, it's a good time. We don't worry about the hate, we just pass it to the side. There's graffiti, community messages, concert announcements. You really never know what you're gonna get here, and that's what makes it so special. You can find it between Cabbage Town and Inman Park. If you've never checked it out, it's a must-see. 
There are hundreds of works of art along the Beltline. I'm talking murals, sculptures, photography. This beautiful mural was created by the artist Hintz. It's 100 feet long, and even though it was created in 2014, it still remains very popular to musicians and photographers alike. You know what time it is. You see your screen. It is time for Friday's box office edition of the A scene. And he was a high school phenom who walked away from the game, but a special group of boys brought him back. I got a chance to catch up with Ben Affleck about his newest movie, The Way Back, where he plays a coach who battles with sobriety and redemption. I also spoke with the cast, all making their first feature film debuts. Take a look. The truth is, they're more talented than you. Probably got a better coach. But I promise you, they are not a better team. You know, you were leading this young pack. This is their first feature film, each one of them. What were some of the first tips that you gave to the fellas? For me, you know, I felt like I had to earn their respect, you know, just as a man and, and as a leader and to treat them with respect and to, you know, um, you know, really develop a genuine relationship. These guys were working very, very hard, both doing the sports stuff and, and the acting, and uh, I really admired it. And they kind of rekindled my love for this whole process. Brandon, when I'm watching you in the film, you know, you're that team captain. Was there ever a time in your life where you didn't feel like you could rise to the occasion? What did you pull from? Well, similarly to the character, I, I, don't, I don't think I had a lot of people that actually tried to push me in my actual day-to-day -day life, so I had to do that for myself. I mean, I had people that supported me, but I didn't really have anybody that challenged me like that. How have you all formed that brotherhood since the movie? When I see Ben, like when I first saw him, it was like this, oh my God, it's Ben, but now I look at him, it's just this He ben. says that, but the first time he saw me, he was like, hey, hey, wait for me to say my line. Yeah, he, was like, he had cut me off, like, no, like, we had our first scene together, and like, he kept cutting off my lines, and I, I didn't talking keep on cutting off. <laughs> One I time, to him, I said, like, like, should say something? I was like, hey, don't cut off. I want Melvin to, you know, if you can, do a little ad lib on top of the beat about your favorite experience shooting this film. Oh my God. That's the hardest thing I've ever heard anyone say. Check it. Oh, yo. Check it. Melvin, we only got a few seconds, so here we go. Why they, why they put me on me? I don't know what to say. It's early in the day. I don't know how to play. I don't have no words. I don't know how to rhyme. Is it, is it about time? For this? <laughs> It was such a fun time interviewing them, and the movie is so good. It truly is art imitating life, as you know. Ben Affleck is battling sobriety, so he really enjoyed making this movie. The movie's in theaters today. And switching gears, calling all actors, musicians, directors, producers who are wondering if their career needs a PR boost. Come learn from the PR professionals, thanks to the Georgia Entertainment PR Alliance this weekend. They'll tell you how to find the right PR for you and also help you build your brand. The panel is going down on Sunday. I'll be moderating 3 to 5 p.m. Just type how to get media coverage into event right for tickets but guess what you can get a free ticket because you are an a scene viewer just send an email over to mitch at left associates that that's l-e-f-f -F associates.com by midnight tonight and let them know you're an a scene viewer you can see that email at the bottom of your screen where do campaign donations go when your candidate of choice decides to call it quits we will verify what they can and cannot use the money for had a middle school student allegedly assaulted for nearly two weeks on the bus, how Fulton County Schools now are responding to the lawsuit. I did. This city has something for every kind of sports fan. So what do you think? Is Atlanta the best city in America? Connect with us. Use Facebook or Instagram and tell us why this city's got it going on. And then watch us every weekday morning from 5 to 7 on the Morning Rush on 11 Alive. newscast not enough for you get even more at 11 alive's youtube channel where you'll find uncut interviews extended body cam footage live streams of atlanta's biggest trials and more subscribe to 11 alive today babe where are my keys uh, where's my lunch where's my phone hey where's my blue shirt <laughs> where's my pen have you seen it Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm gonna go ahead and retire. <laughs>
It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. I woke up at 2 in the morning to be here. Where were you? Once you allow it, right, then it sets you up for the entire week where you just have lost it. Like on a, on a Sunday, it's like, oh, let's just order some Chinese food. And, of course, you wind up eating tons of that. And then on Monday, you're like, well, I got leftovers. I can't let it go to waste. Auntie wants to give you a plate to take home from the barbecue. Uh, auntie. No. <laughs> auntie, don't invite me to the barbecue. I'm going to be looking for you next time. So use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. The 11 Alive app is your go-to source for all things Atlanta. You hear what happened today? I'll tell you all about it. Breaking news the moment it happens. The Boyle Water Advisory. Hyperlocal, accurate weather alert. You may want to grab that sweater, maybe even a coat. More stories to uncover. More videos to discover. He did it his way. Personalized for you. And that's what makes it so special. The 11 Alive app. Available now in the App Store. Hey, I got the ways to go. I got moves to make. Call me, but I stay in the flow. So you just do what I say. I'm no, my movement ain't faded. You kill the super. Oh, and so I was saying, there is always something filming here in Atlanta. From movies to TV shows, you name it. And so the AC keeps up with all of it for you. Casting calls, which big celebrities are in town, what's filming, and if it's in your neighborhood. It's like an inside scoop. Oh, nice. But you know, I really wish you would have told us we were filming this. Today, Ooh, did I not text you? All right. Ah, it's in my drafts. That's my bad. So you slept in and you missed morning rush, huh? Well, here's what you missed. In my experience, good guys do finish last. Mm. Oh, I, I consider nice myself guy. a nice guy. Yeah, I've nice got moment. the most beautiful woman in the world in my eyes. You're a nice guy too, yeah. Jess. I'm saying in my experience, when growing up, good guys didn't oh, finish last. Oh, Somebody <laughs> broke his heart somewhere along the line. We're here every weekday morning, so come on, hang out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. It is a new rule that will likely draw legal challenges. The Trump administration will begin collecting DNA samples from hundreds of thousands of people under a new rule that will expand a federal database of genetic information used by law enforcement. Here's Elvin Lopez. So immigration authorities will soon begin gathering those DNA samples from migrants taken into federal custody. Now, this works and this comes from two Trump administration officials that say agents will fully enforce a law passed in 2005 that requires taking DNA samples from any non-U.S. citizens detained, as well as anyone who has been arrested, is facing charges, or has been convicted of a crime. Now, that DNA will then go into the FBI's combined DNA index system, which allows DNA comparison to find criminals. We spoke to immigration attorney Marilyn Lynn Tedesco a few months ago about this, and she says that she worries that asylum seekers trying to gain legal access to the U.S. will get cut up in all of this. So they're now dragging civil individuals who are seeking protection legally in the United States, presenting themselves legally, and yet they're being treated like the criminals that we were supposed to be finding with DNA samples. During the Obama administration, the Department of Homeland Security asked for an exemption, saying it didn't have the manpower to gather the samples, but the Trump administration is now saying that the process is now easier and cheaper. Immigration is a hot-button topic this election season. We have a team of 11 Alive journalists dedicated to covering the political issues that matter most to you during the election year. Be sure to check our special politics section of 11alive.com. A bus driver with Fulton County Schools currently off his route after accusations that a student was sexually assaulted for several days by other students on that bus without any intervention. The family of a 14-year-old girl with special needs is now suing the district. The lawsuit alleges their child was assaulted day after day by two other students on the school bus, escalating to the point of rape. The family's lawyer claims the assaults were caught on video and the driver must have heard or seen them, yet did nothing.
This was a one-time incident. Maybe he didn't catch it. 17 days of horrific sexual assault. That's a guy who, excuse the pun, is asleep at the wheel. The attorney says the Fulton County Schools won't give him a copy of the video. And 11 months later, a spokesperson says the claims are still under investigation. Today, Fulton County Schools said the bus driver was immediately separated from the district. We have reached out to see if that means he was fired, reassigned, or suspended. The school district says it is concerned but wants to respect student privacy since the students involved are all minors. The lawsuit demands money to help pay for the girl's treatment. A Marietta man accused of choking, headbutting, and trying to kill a woman, 32-year-old Damian Rodriguez Pavone, was arrested today. According to an arrest warrant, Pavone held a woman against a bed, choking her, yelling he was going to kill her. He says he also headbutted her three times and broke her nose. He wouldn't let her leave the apartment. The warrant says the victim was able to escape and call police when Pavone went to the bathroom. Now he is facing multiple charges. A Conyers police officer back home after he was hurt in a crash yesterday morning. The Georgia State Patrol says Officer Eric Green was driving with his lights activated through a red light at Georgia 138 and Flat Shoals Road, but switched lanes before he got out of the intersection. Another driver was going through the green light and hit him. Officer Green's car then hit another vehicle. The officer was taken to the hospital, but is now resting at home. The driver that hit the patrol car had minor injuries. UGA star Anthony Edwards says no autographs, please, but it is for a reason. Anthony Edwards tweeted he appreciates his fans and supporters, but he is taking the CDC's advice to stop shaking hands and signing autographs to help prevent the spread of coronavirus that he wrote in two words. The NBA has already advised players to fist bump with fans instead of high five them. The final venue for the 2020 Olympics is now complete, bringing the U.S. closer to the summer games in Tokyo. Organizers say work on the Aquatic Center was finished in February, meaning that all the venues built for this year's Olympics have been completed on time. The Aquatic Center, which will host swimming and diving events, was one of eight new venues built for the Summer Olympics, in addition to the Athletes' Village. A total of 43 venues will be used during Tokyo and the Olympics coming up this summer. Now, this news comes as the coronavirus outbreak has raised questions about whether the games might be postponed or not. Over the past few, day, uh, few days, the Japanese government has been insistent the competition will begin as scheduled. 11 Alive Sports, Alex Glaze sat down with two Olympians today to talk about their concerns. He would tell you that he's training just for today. But the truth is, Eric Kennard is training for Tokyo. And while he's focused on his training, he's also aware of how the coronavirus is starting to affect sports and could possibly affect the 2020 Olympic Games. Now, are you worried about the coronavirus? I don't possess a spirit of fear. You've known me for a long time. You know, I, you know, I don't possess a spirit of fear in that case. I am not ignorant to the risk associated with being sick. Uh, and I know the statistics involving the sickness. This isn't the first time a global health scare has threatened to impact the Olympics. In 2016, the Zika virus was the it's big always thing. Something, man. There, it's it was, always that something. was the big thing, yeah, and that was something. going into the Rio yeah, game. Yeah, so do, I, do you remember yeah. the fear going into that? And does this kind of feel similar? Or does this feel different? This is a little different. Uh, this is... As far as global, you know, panic and fear, that exists around this, that, and it didn't exist around, you know, the Zika virus. Influenza is, you know, that's airborne, you know what I mean? Like, that's totally different. As the coronavirus continues to spread, sports leagues around the world are adjusting, and sporting events without fans may soon be the new normal. Have you thought about the possibility of the Olympics not having any spectators? That would be extremely weird. I don't think that that would ever happen. It's the biggest sporting event in the world. Have you thought about the possibility of the Olympics being canceled? No, no, I just don't think it will happen. Um, so I haven't really entertained that possibility. What makes you say that, that you don't think it would happen? You're talking money, you know. Like that's a lot of money, a lot of preparation taking place. I think a delay uh, is a little more appropriate as far as preparing for what they have to deal with and what the world is dealing with as far as the sickness is, is concerned. Well, the games are still going on as scheduled. Organizers announced they will be scaling back on the torch relay, which began later this month. Each torch bearer will also have their temperature tested before running. 
It's a startling headline about the coronavirus for anyone with a pet. A pet dog in Hong Kong tested positive for COVID-19. But how concerned should you be for your four-legged friend? Let's connect the dots. The Hong Kong Agriculture, Fisheries and Conservation Department reports that a dog in quarantine with its infected owner tested weekly positive for the coronavirus. Health experts believe the animal was infected by its owner, but they stress it does not appear pets can pass the virus on to humans. The animal is being kept in quarantine until Hong Kong authorities can give it a clean bill of health. Even though health officials believe pets cannot infect humans, they are still recommending people wash their hands after handling their animals and avoid kissing them as well. Several candidates have dropped out of the race ahead of Georgia's presidential primary on March 24th. So what happens for those of you who donated to a campaign that decided to call it quits? Our sister station in D.C. looked at where that money can go. Here's Evan Kosolov to verify. The Verify team is here to work for you. If you see something that looks a little fishy or hear something that just doesn't sound right, send it to us. We'll do the work to get the facts. That's what Richard Piazza did from suburban Virginia when he saw all these candidates jumping out of the race. When a campaign closes and they pay all their bills and pay all their employees and there are funds left over, what happens to those funds? So let's verify. Are there limits on how former candidates spend their leftover campaign money? According to our source, the Federal Elections Commission, the answer is yes. But the devil's in the details. So let's get into it. The rules say they can spend that money, but only if it's not for personal use. So let's get to some examples. Charity, all good. Give it to a local, state, or national party, no problem. You could even give it to a future campaign. For example, Amy Klobuchar could transfer the money to a future Senate campaign. What about where you can't spend the money? Clothing, entertainment, groceries. There are also the more bizarre expenses that are explicitly banned, like tuition payments or funeral expenses. So we can verify, yes, there are strict rules that all candidates must follow when it comes to that leftover campaign cash. And a reminder, Georgia's primary is March 24th. If you have a question about the election that you want us to verify, send us an email. The president visits, uh, visits the CDC as part of the administration's response to coronavirus. So how are they doing? Our Jennifer Bellamy talks with NBC's Chuck Todd when we come back. We are going to see another nice day here tomorrow, and it'll be without the wind. That wind will finally start dying down. The rain chances will come back, though. We'll let you know when they'll move back into the outlook. No postseason for Georgia Tech basketball, but there is a ray of sunshine, a guard who played all year for two people that he loves the most. That story when we come back. Slimming down. Okay, yes. yeah. Right, yeah, okay. Yeah. A little water yes. in my cup. And, and beautiful skin. <laughs> well, you know, even too. more beautiful skin, you know, when it's all <laughs> hydrated and everything else. I'm not going to be able to sit next to you in a few months. <laughs> Don't drink your morning coffee alone. Have it with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Some mornings, what you want isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the Rush Blog, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. Catch the Rush Block on the Morning Rush. Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your Morning Rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hotspots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. News of the mural went viral when Big Boy himself gave a shout out on Instagram. You can find it tucked away in a back parking lot in Little Five Points. An Atlanta icon, ever changing, always interesting. The Crock Street Tunnel is full of artwork from some pristy, eclectic Atlanta artists. You always feel it's good vibe. When you vibe with it, it's a good time. We don't worry about the hate, we just pass it to the side. There's graffiti, community messages, concert announcements. You really never know what you're gonna get here, and that's what makes it so special. You can find it between Cabbage Town and Inman Park. If you've never checked it out, it's a must see. 
There are hundreds of works of art along the Beltline. I'm talking murals, sculptures, photography. This beautiful mural was created by the artist Hintz. It's 100 feet long. And even though it was created in 2014, it still remains very popular to musicians and photographers alike. You can find it on the East Side Trail under Virginia Avenue. So let me know what you think. It doesn't have to be street art. Maybe your favorite spot is down the street from your home or a great view. Connect with me on Facebook and Instagram and share your favorite Instagram spots in Atlanta. And come hang out with me on Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. I haven't seen you in a while. Where you been? It looks like fun. It they does. are fun. <laughs> they're and they're convenient. Fun. Yeah. But they're being dumped everywhere. 5,000 scooters at one time active throughout the city. I enjoy them myself. They're fun. Yeah. There's got to be some regulations. That's I just feel the like thing. they have to evolve with the times, though. They're not mm -hmm. going anywhere. They shouldn't go anywhere. It's a new yeah. way of transporting. Yeah. We have to evolve. I'm going to be looking for you next time, so use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. You see them all day, every day. Headlines, stats, and numbers, but without context, they're just clickbait. So let's add some perspective. The three most interesting numbers that President Trump in town for a tour of the CDC as government and health officials try to stave off the spread of the coronavirus here in the United States. Joining me now, Chuck Todd, moderator of Meet the Press. Chuck, both the president and the vice president have done their best to try and reassure the public about the coronavirus. Do you think that they've been using an effective strategy so far? Well, look, I think um, I think the vice president and the and the and the team um, that he's now leading have, have, have tried to tried to do that. I think the, for the president himself, you know, he sometimes uh, he likes to take matters into his own hands. Uh, and I think it, whether he means to or not, he certainly has delivered what appears to be mixed messages at times. What the vice president and the task force say and what the president says sometimes come across as two different things. And then the president might clean it up and say, oh, his words were misinterpreted. But I think there is a concern that there is a bit of perceived uncertainty at the top. One of the problems with this one is the president's instinct sometimes is to overpromise, uh, and he'll worry about uh, worry about the, the fallout later. In a public health crisis, overpromising can really create um, difficult moments down the road. This is one of those cases where the president's marketing instincts, in some ways, aren't serving him well. All right, let's kind of shift gears a little bit. Georgia's primary just about 18 days away from now. Pretty much a two-horse race in the Democratic Party. It, the big favorite, Joe Biden, right now. What can Bernie Sanders do to overcome what happened, uh, what we saw on Super Tuesday? He needs to have something dramatic that I have no idea what that would be. That's my point here, meaning, like, I don't think there's anything he can do. I think if, if everything continues to break demographically, that it broke on Super Tuesday, then it's very difficult for Sanders to find a path to this nomination. And, in fact, I don't know if Georgia's going to be relevant by the time the primary comes on March 24th. When you look at the states between now and Georgia's primary on March 24th, let's be realistic. We already saw what South Carolina did. We already saw what Alabama did. We already saw what Tennessee did. Have I described three states that border Georgia? We have an idea of what's going to happen in Florida. It's hard to imagine Georgia's going to be that competitive. Um, but if it is, by the time it comes around, then something dramatic that we have, we have not foreseen has happened. My point is, that's how difficult I think this path is right now for Bernie Sanders. All right, Chuck, thank you so much. Meet the Press air Sunday at 10 a.m. right here on 11 Live. Chuck, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Jennifer. President Trump joined thousands of volunteers in Tennessee today. Recovery efforts continue in the wake of two deadly tornadoes. At least two dozen people were killed after the EF-4 and an EF-3 tornado hit the outskirts of Nashville on Tuesday. As teams clean up miles of debris, they are also uncovering amazing stories of survival. Here's Jay Gray. President Trump on the ground in Middle Tennessee getting a first-hand look at the devastation, thanking first responders and promising assistance for survivors as the cleanup and recovery begin. God be with them, and we're going to be with them. We're going to be with them all the way.
thousands of volunteers in and around Nashville aren't waiting for federal help. They've been working here since the winds died down. Seeing all the devastation right now is pretty surreal and realizing these are people's lives and it's been turned upside down and seeing people come, it gives me hope that, you know, they, are, they can rebuild. As they continue to sift through what the storms left behind, there are also now amazing stories of survival emerging from all the twisted metal and broken glass. I seen something hit the side of the car and all the windows bust out and felt the car start to lift up off the ground. But at that point, it all just went into a blur. This is their car now. As it was tossed 60 yards or so in the air, Amber Bingham dove from the passenger seat to the back to protect her little girl. I just grabbed her head and I shoved it down and I just got over her and I just held her. And if I wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't be here because there's nothing left from my passenger seat. There's not much left of their community either. But right now, oh my gosh, I'm blessed to be here. There's no other place they'd rather be. We've been wanting to dry out and today we did dry out. In fact, this map shows where the dry air is in place and where you see the purple color that's indicating very dry air and we've got it. It's going to stick around with us too. As we move through the weekend, you see here comes the timestamp right up here at the top. You can see on Saturday still the purple color indicating dry air also on Sunday. Then on Monday, we're going to see a few more clouds around, but we still won't see any rain. That moisture is starting to build out to the west. That's going to move our way on Tuesday, and that's where we're going to see our rain chances that are going to start coming back up. There will be a lot of moisture content in the air to um, enhance that potential for some of those showers around. And then into Wednesday as well, we might see a couple of breaks. And then uh, again, you can see these colors kind of going closer to the blue. And what I want you to notice here from this map it's not going to be substantial rain and consistent, persistent, heavy rain like we had earlier this week. This is just going to be enough moisture content in the air that's going to kick up a few scattered showers for us as we head into uh, the middle of next week and the end of next week as well. Meanwhile, we're nice and dry out there right now. And actually that dry air and the lower dew points are going to allow those temperatures to fall a little bit more tonight. Right now we're 45. We have 40 in Duluth, 40 in Gainesville, 39 in Canton, and then a little milder down to the south, 47 in Peachtree City, 46 in LaGrange compared to those 30s up to the north of us. Uh, and so it's going to be rather chilly in the morning. We're going to start off around freezing and we're going to stay dry going through the weekend. And with that dry air and with the sunshine, we'll see temperatures gradually warming up a little bit. Tomorrow we'll get up to 60 and then into the mid 60s for the uh, uh, Sunday afternoon hours. And then the showers are going to start to move back into our area once we head into next week. But that's the key word. It's going to be showers, not constant rain. So in the morning, get ready to be cold to start off 33 in the morning. We get up to 60 in the afternoon, mostly sunny skies on Sunday, mostly sunny, maybe a few more clouds building in later in the day. Temperatures between 63 and 65 degrees in the afternoon hour. So here's the European model showing what we've got going on with the Sunday still mostly sunny, a couple of additional clouds later in the day. It's on Monday when I think we'll see a really uh, better coverage of clouds around and they'll be a little bit thicker. So they're going to block out more sun during the day on Monday, but still no rain in our area. Then into Tuesday, that's when the moisture moves back in. That's that moisture content in the air increasing, as I was mentioning, and we'll see those showers developing. But see on Wednesday, not a constant rain. We're just talking about a few scattered showers around on Thursday, a few scattered showers around. Same thing on Friday as well. So it's not like what we had this week. So when you see these raindrops there on the forecast, uh, it's not like what we had earlier in the week. We see the mostly sunny skies Saturday and Sunday. Uh, don't forget to spring forward. Do that Saturday night. Just uh, set your clock ahead one hour. Do that before you go to bed Saturday night. Sunday 65, 66 Monday, 68 Tuesday, and there's that rain chance at 50%. 40% chance Wednesday and Thursday, 30% chance Friday, and look how those temperatures warm up into the 60s and 70s. No ACC tournament for Georgia Tech because of their NCAA violations, so instead they end the year on the road at Clemson. Josh Pastner's team trying to finish the season with the winning record for the ACC. It would be the first time since about 03, and it looked good early. Michael DeVoe from Long Range 
Tech up by 11 at halftime. Clemson came back. They would lead by nine late, but DeVoe took over, drives into the lane, gets fouled, and scores. He had 20 points. The game under a minute. DeVoe again. The floater in the lane is good. Tech finishes the game on a 15-3 run and wins at 65-62. The Jackets finish at 11-9 and nine in the ACC, and they have some momentum toward next year. One shining light for the Yellow Jackets has been Jose Alvarado. The junior guard had a breakout year and dedicated this season to his family. Maria Martin has his story. I always feel like oh, I got a chip on my shoulders going out there and trying to show it, prove everybody that I belong here. Jose Alvarado had a sensational year for Georgia Tech. Alvarado, some strange music. The junior guard from Brooklyn overcame two serious career injuries, including one this year, to come out and score 1,000 career points and also be a top 10 scorer in the ACC. Right now, it's falling my way, and I'm less to keep it rolling that way. You know him from his eccentric dance moves. When I hit a three, obviously, I'm going to hit a three and then go and chippy on court personality i knew my team was like i knew i knew how we really are i mean it's just coming out little by little i always talk trash and i'm intense it could be a pickle game in the park like i'm there like I'm <laughs> you gonna, don't care who it is no i'm talking no little kid my love i got a little brother back home we always go at it jose alvarado reaches the 20 point plateau but peel back the layers, and there's a motivation behind everything you see on the floor. And it says everything for her. I get a little emotional about talking about my grandmother. She raised me as a kid. Um, she died from cancer. I saw her fight in the hospital probably for like two weeks strong. When they called them and they told me the news, it was just like my world shut down. I didn't want to play basketball. I didn't want to go to school. I didn't want to do nothing. And my mom said, do you, you think she will want that? And I'm like, nah. And then I just motivated me so much that, hey, it got me a scholarship at Georgia Tech. And hopefully my dream comes true later on. He's also now a brand new girl dad, giving life a new meaning and purpose for the standout guard. I think of it is as the best thing in the world because I'm doing something I love to do on the court and I'm coming home and something that I couldn't express how I feel. Just seeing her every day, that's like, that's, that's me, that's a little me. So I'm gonna tell her all about her grandmother and I'm gonna tell her how we should just fight and enjoy life, you know? You never know when it's gonna come to an end. Maria Martin reporting for us. A chill in the air, but that doesn't bother soccer fans. A big block party in Summerhill for Atlanta United supporters. The Five Stripes play their MLS home opener against Cincinnati on Saturday night. Hawks without Trey Young in Washington. He has symptoms of the flu. The Hawks not well either. They lose to the Wizards 118-112. Stands up all help shape the future of America. Once in Olympic City, Atlanta's home to the best sports scene across the nation. Hey look, the South has something to say. You won't find more passionate fans anywhere. From the Atlanta Braves home run king, my man, Hank Aaron, to the human highlight film, Hawks' Dominique Wilkins, some of the greatest athletes have come through Atlanta. We're talking the Falcons, the Braves, the Hawks, the MLS champs, Atlanta United. This city has something for every kind of sports fan. So what do you think? Is Atlanta the best city in America? Connect with us. Use Facebook or Instagram and tell us why this city's got it going on. And then watch us every weekday morning from 5 to 7 on The Morning Rush on 11 Alive. newscast not enough for you get even more at 11 alive's youtube channel where you'll find uncut interviews extended body cam footage live streams of atlanta's biggest trials and more subscribe to 11 alive today babe where are my keys uh, where's my lunch where's my phone hey where's my blue shirt where's my pen have you seen it Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foyne Associates. I woke up at 2 in the morning to be here. Where were you? Why
once you allow it, right, then it sets you up for the entire week where you just have lost it. Like on, a, on a Sunday, it's like, oh, let's just order some Chinese food, and of course you wind up eating tons of that. And then on Monday, you're like, well, I got leftovers. I can't let it go. Oh, and Auntie wants to give you a plate to take home from the barbecue. Uh, Auntie. No. Auntie, don't invite me to the barbecue. I'm going to be looking for you next time, so use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekday, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. The 11 Alive app is your go-to source for all things Atlanta. You hear what happened today? I'll tell you all about it. Breaking news the moment it happens. The Boyle Water Advisory. Hyper-local, accurate weather alert. You may want to grab that sweater, maybe even a coat. More stories to uncover. More videos to discover. He did it his way. Personalized for you. And that's what makes it so special. The 11 Alive app. Available now in the App Store. Hey, I got the ways to go. I got moves to make. Call me, but I stay in the flow. So you to do what I say. I'm no, 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 You can assume what you're doing with freedom. Oh, and so I was saying, there is always something filming here in Atlanta. From movies to TV shows, you name it. And so the A-Scene keeps up with all of it for you. Casting calls, which big celebrities are in town, what's filming, and if it's in your neighborhood. It's like an inside scoop. Oh, nice. But you know, I really wish you would have told us we were filming this. Today, ooh. Some people might get bored looking at this radar. No, not me. With that scan going around and mm -hmm. not picking up anything, but I've actually enjoyed looking at this today <laughs> with the dry weather that we have in place. So uh, that's a really good thing to me, seeing that radar with nothing on it. But if you look up to the north and east of us, we have a little bit of moisture that's moving up the mid-Atlantic region. On the back side, a little bit of snow coming down through the North Carolina mountains and also into uh, parts of Virginia and into West Virginia. That moisture is going to stay away from us. We are going to be nice and dry for the weekend, mostly sunny skies. It is going to be chilly in the morning down to 33 here in town. Many of you will be at freezing and there's still going to be a breeze in the morning, so it's going to feel even colder. High temperatures up to about 66 degrees on Sunday. We're up to 65 and then 66 Monday, but that's when we start to see some changes. Clouds on the increase Monday and then the rain chances come back. It's going to be scattered showers, not torrential flooding rain or anything. Just kind of scattered showers there Tuesday at 50% chance, 40% chance Wednesday and Thursday, and then a 30% chance on Friday. And Jeff, temperatures in the 60s through the weekend, and then next week we have 70s Wednesday through Friday. It's all good. I was looking at some radar from 79 and 80 <laughs> in Atlanta yeah. TV. Color radar. I couldn't figure anything out. <laughs> I didn't see anything. Anyway, it's a great improvement. I'm not complaining. Skin, you know, when it's all <laughs> hydrated and everything else. I'm not gonna be able to sit next to you in a few months. <laughs> Don't drink your morning coffee alone. Have it with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Some mornings, what you want isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the Rush Block, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. Catch the Rush Block on the Morning Rush. Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foyne Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hotspots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. <laughs> News of the mural went viral when Big Boy himself gave a shout out on Instagram. You can find it tucked away in a back parking lot in Little Five Points. An Atlanta icon, ever-changing, always interesting. The Crog Street Tunnel is full of artwork from some pristy, eclectic Atlanta artists. You always feel it's good vibe. When you vibe with it, it's a good time. We don't worry about the hate, we just pass it to the side. There's graffiti, community messages, concert announcements. You really never know what you're gonna get here, and that's what makes it so special. You can find it between Cabbage Town and Inman Park. If you've never checked it out, it's a must-see. 
There are hundreds of works of art along the Beltline. I'm talking murals, sculptures, photography. This beautiful mural was created by the artist Hence. It's 100 feet long, and even though it was created in 2014, it still remains very popular to musicians and photographers alike. You can find it on the East Side Trail under Virginia Avenue. So let me know what you think. It doesn't have to be street art. Maybe your favorite spot is down the street from your home or a great view. Connect with me on Facebook and Instagram and share your favorite Instagram spots in Atlanta. And come hang out with me on Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. I haven't seen you in a while. Where you been? It looks like fun. It they does. are fun. <laughs> they're and they're a lot convenient. Of fun. But they're being dumped everywhere. 5,000 scooters at one time active throughout the city. I enjoy them myself. They're fun. Yeah. There's got to be some regulations. I just feel like we have to.